Wow. Well, thanks for that. So you go in the court room again. Oh, wow. right, I'd like to call this work session of the Southampton Town Board to order on the second day of May 2019. Please rise and join me for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Lynn is here from Sunday's office, the clerk's office. Uh, Lynn, would you please call the roll? Supervisor Schneiderman. Here. Councilwoman Lofsted. Here. Councilwoman Scalera. Councilman Bouvier. Here. Councilman Schiavone. Schiavone. I'm sorry. Present. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> That's all right. It's nine minutes. All right, so we have a quorum here. All right, so we're going to start with... Uh, Appraisal for the development right value in the Southampton School District. We're joined by Kyle Collins, our Town Planning and Development Administrator, um, David Wilcox, our Town Planning Director, and uh, Eleanor Brunswick, uh, appraiser. So nice to see you, Eleanor. Thank you. All right, uh, Kyle, you want to? Yeah, I'll just up. Yeah, I'll set it up. Uh, as the board may recall, um, back in the fall, we had uh, hired uh, Eleanor. Uh, from MAI to do an appraisal of development rights uh, within the Southampton School District. And the reason for doing that, uh, we have approximately a little over 15 development rights uh, from the Conklin piece, which is on Cedar Lane in North Sea. Uh, and the intention uh, is to sell those development rights. And prior to selling them, we needed to know what the fair market value was. The reason for selling those development right was to replenish the affordable housing fund, which was originally <coughs> utilized to purchase a portion of this property, and then later on determined by the town board to preserve the entire <coughs> town. So in order to um, reimburse the affordable housing fund, the town board chose to uh, go through the process of putting those development rights that are coming off there and sell them to reimburse the affordable housing fund. So Kyle, before, um, the board has never formally stripped the development rights from this property. I know no, a resolution wants to do it that didn't go through, but the, uh, so we'd have to formally strip the development rights at some point by resolution? No, I believe that they have been stripped from there. I don't think they were, no, but that's okay. It's a, yeah, they were. They were. We have a resolution. They, they, it, it was a joint resolution to take the rights off, put them in the bank, and to give them to the housing authority. Uh, but the, oh, so you're just cleansing the fund. Yeah. But there was an issue with that. I remember because at one point we were thinking of selling the portion that was supposedly for affordable housing to generate the money, and then instead we said, no, we'll just sell the development rights. Do you remember this? This this all came up when Spion Commons was. Uh, it was originally 51 units, then we reduced it down to 38 units, but we needed to bring some subsidy in to make the numbers work. There was like a million dollar shortfall, a million and a half. Uh, eventually, the Attorney General of the State of New York came up with some money, but I had looked to the Conklin piece to fill that gap. Um, there was kind of public controversy around it. Uh, some of the neighbors were very upset with the idea, thought it was preserved. Um, the, the property itself, a third of the acquisition came from the affordable housing fund. Yeah, it was originally two thirds. two thirds. Two thirds, thank you, two thirds. Yeah. But it was never, it was not a meets and bounds description or something of where that was. And then there was a, a resolution that I had seen, but it had never been executed. So this, the development rights had not actually been stripped. Maybe there's a re we, resolution to do it. But it was wasn't fulfilled. That's my recollection. I don't think that's correct. Well, we can look into that yeah, today. It's not about that. Today's about the appraisal and see what those are and whatever steps we need to take. We'll take those steps. Okay. Right. Kathleen, any other questions before we turn this over to uh, okay. Eleanor? We'll, we'll look into it, Mr. Supervisor. Okay. Yeah. As you indicated, there was a final step that needed to be taken in terms of recording the TDR and the conservation easement, and we're not sure that that actually. Happened. Yeah, I don't think that, that has happened. happened. Right, that's the piece that hadn't happened. So that, because I think the resolution we were discussing was to rescind that resolution. Correct. That, okay. And that resolution got withdrawn. That resolution got withdrawn. 
So that resolution has been passed, but it's never been finalized. Actuated, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Sorry, okay. Ellen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so then we hired you then, to figure out right. what the actual value of, of a development might in accordance with 330-9, the density incentive provisions. Can you can you explain what a development right is? Ah. And what you can do with it? Because that's going to help determine what the value is, obviously. So well, you obviously okay. did that work. A development right is basically that use set or utility that can be taken from a property and, and used um, for, for um, <coughs> based on its density and bulk uh, and the zoning, of course. It's um, specific to a school district, right? Specific in this instance to the um, Southampton School District. Right. So you couldn't use a development right, let's say, from the Hampton Bay School District to add a carriage house in Southampton. That's right. Okay. But that's one of the things you can do, add a carriage house, right? Yes. So there were three. Clear more land. Correct. Right. So we. So basically I looked at the, the code and I then did an analysis from an appraisal perspective, of course, on how to arrive at the various development rights that could be applied to the density incentives, one being an increased yield subdivision or an undersized lot subdivision, two, a carriage house density, or three, a non-residential density incentive. And the non-residential would cover all of the non-residential, all the commercial and industrial districts. So it was a very broad uh, based type of assignment and I then went about each section of the density bonus in valuing each component, if you will, and arrived at a value for that development right if it was for an increased lot or yield subdivision or for a Undersized lot subdivision, I came to a value because one development right equaled one housing unit, one okay. dwelling. Can they also be used um, as a sanitary credit? Let's say you're, you're a restaurant, you're trying to get more seats. Yes. They yes, can. That so the is health correct. department does recognize them? Yes, it does. That's right. And, and that's, that's part of the non residential component. Correct. Okay. So yeah, we, I address that yeah, right, absolutely. In, that, in that component of the appraisal. Yeah. So the first thing I did was I looked at all, and I went back to January 1st, 2014, and I tracked sales of all the lots, for instance, in the different zoning districts. And I analyzed all of them, and I came up with median prices, and I arrived at what I considered was a market value of a value for a development right if it were applied to get another lot. Right. So re whether it be because of an undersized lot subdivision or whether it be for a increased yield. Does that apply in the villages too or only in the town? Only in the town. Only in the town. Only in the town. In the town. Okay. Okay, so then, then that, that was the first analysis. The second Excuse me for a second. Yeah. Yes. For health department, it may anyway. be a different story. But as it relates to our zoning, we don't have zoning authority. Right. But if you're using it simply for health department, it could potentially be used for in the village. Right. <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> then um, the next uh, component was a carriage house. Now, that, that was a little trickier because carriage house um, is is a, a great incentive, actually, but it's not that easy to find in the marketplace the value of what no, that sure. add-on Nobody be. sells them once they have. You don't sell a carriage house. Right. So we're looking at the land, actually. You sell a house with a carriage house. Right. So you're looking at the If someone had the property and they were able to put another carriage house, what would they pay for that ability? Sure. And it's really land. So I had to back sure. into arriving oh. at the value. I, I did in that today's, in a uh, few different scenarios. Is, you know, with, with the lack of affordably priced housing right now, I mean, businesses are struggling to find workers because of the housing issue. Yes. I would think a carriage house would be particularly valuable for somebody who's looking to find a place to house their own employees. Hmm? Yes. Their caretakers. It could, it could be a very, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, so I did um, analyze extracting that finding sales, for instance, houses that had a carriage house, 
compared to ones that did not. Sure. I extracted it. I also did a whole residual methodology because of the lack of data using rentals, mm -hmm. capitalizing that rental, deducting a cost of construction. This is why we hired you. Yeah, <laughs> and then we arrived at a value. Okay, that was the carriage house. Um, uh, yes. Help me understand why we're so specifically focused on a carriage house and how that how that gets transposed here to what we're, you know, the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do. Because we, the it's development rights, you have to determine where they're going to land. And 330 I mean, and for three, the public edification, because it's, and, and it's three, very. Yeah, and 330 9 identifies where you can utilize a development right. And one of those options is for a carriage house. In order to get a carriage house, you have to meet certain lot standard sizes. <laughs> And in effect, if you meet those standards, you can go right to the building department with a development right and, in effect, get a second dwelling unit on your lot. What way to think of it, John, would be like a coupon. <clears throat> well, I, I meant it for the public. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, and I, and I mean this for the public, yeah, okay. too, yeah. <laughs> not for your own yeah. So one way to think about it is, is like a coupon. You need to know what stores you can use that coupon in and right. what you can get with that coupon. And yeah. that's sort of the same thing. Right. Where can it be used? What is the value of yeah. that use? Right. I mean, it's tricky because I've done this for some other towns, as a matter of fact, but it's going to a specific receiving area. Yeah. And that, I think, might be where you were thinking also yeah. of this, because specifically then you would look at that particular analysis of that receiving lot. And yeah. then what would the add-on be for that, having it or not having it? Right. I've done that in the town of Huntington, that type of thing. But yeah. this is a general broad brush, what's the value of development, right? And there's a lot of different components to this where somebody could right. apply it to. I mean, at the end of this, there's an auction. So let's say, just use the coupon analogy, let's say it's a $20 coupon. Somebody may pay $15 for that $20 coupon, and if that's the highest price, that's the highest price. They not they might not pay full value, but we're trying to determine full value so we can set a price at the auction. Right. Yeah. And one of the oh, things, and Kathleen may want to jump in, we, you know, because it's an asset that the town holds, we can't sell it for anything less than market value, right? Because we can't give away that asset, right? So that's why we had to determine what the market value was for these. We can't sell less than market value? No. It's like any other, as Kyle indicated, it's like any other town asset. So you can only sell it for fair and um, adequate consideration, which we arrive at by an appraisal. What if, uh, what if we can't get somebody to pay full fair market value? <clears throat> uh, well, the market will dictate that, but I find that hard. I mean, <laughs> it's because isn't ultimately that how you determine fair market value is what the market is willing to pay for it? Yes, and I, I, I personally don't foresee that problem. Yeah. There's a need for these, and the market di dictates that price. So okay. I, uh, we can talk about that if it, if the opportunity if that happened, but I'm not sure that that will happen. It's okay. more about the we have we have I have an example of this happening. The, the Pine Barrens Commission just put up 10, 10 Pine Barren credits up for sale, and they uh, established the value. I forget how they did it. But they established a value. They went out and they didn't get it, so they rejected all bids. Now they're going to go back out, and I think they went back and tried to determine what the value, and they're going to put it back out. So that could happen. Right. Then you so we would just ha value. we would just have to you know, and then sharpen our pencil or something. But based on what our analysis is today, that's uh, we're utilizing that in our notice to bidders. So I have a question. So you have the average here of 270, 275,000. We're not even there yet. So. Yeah. I, I know. We're getting there. Right. Well, yeah. But we're talking about fair market value, Still but the fair market value for a residential lot analysis would be 410. So I understand why you're averaging it, but doesn't that mean that somebody's getting a really good deal and somebody isn't? <coughs> Maybe. Well, what we did is exactly what. <laughs> I think that's why you Kathleen said we don't think that there's going to be a problem here. Okay, well, I did. <laughs> I, I did even got to, that I did yeah. apply a discount. I did yeah. apply a discount. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because is the market going to be paying a million dollars for a, you know a development right to put another lot somewhere? Sure. And my, I don't think so. Do you have uh, Eleanor? Is yeah. are there actual sales of development rights that you can track to or no? No. Okay, so that no, makes it no. tricky. That would have been. 
Yeah, it would have been helpful. Yeah. Okay, let me let me kick it back to you to finish your so yeah so so basically then that was a carriage house and um, analysis that I just explained the two different scenarios and then when it got to the non-residential that was a the way, I, the way I did that was also, there were two different ways to look at that. You could increase your gross building area by 2 to 10 percent. Okay, so how, do I, how did I um, figure that out? I, you had to, one of the, one of the um, requirements or criteria was that the density incentive had to have a lot area minimum of one acre. So I looked at all of the commercial properties in the school district of Southampton. And I found everything that was over one acre, and I came to a mi I averaged what all of the uh, data was, and it came to like 1.75 acres. I ended up then um, applying a um, basically it was a I applied a rent per square foot. Again, this was a rental analysis in which I was able to then take out your come down to a net income, capitalize that into a value, and then take out the cost of construction for that, come to a value based on that. In terms of the, um, I also then looked at the uh, 300 gallon per day health requirement, which was um, the sewage disposal mm -hmm. analysis, and I for based on that on residential basis or on commercial basis. Only commercial. Okay. For that, that was on the commercial basis, okay. and I looked at, for instance, if someone wanted to add a wet use onto a shopping center, right. which would be something similar to a restaurant, which would be something that in the town of Southampton would be more realistic in terms of a right. choice as to what they would that want could to even use. Go into, let's say the village, right? So there we did, um, you know, I, I ended up doing a whole analysis on the restaurants, came to a value based on restaurant uses, and actually um, came to ultimately a price per, per seat basis and um, deducted the cost to construct, and it turned out that it did not make economic sense to actually construct the, it, it, it was over the, the amount was more to construct than it was to actually buy the value of what it would be to add on to uh, the sewage for that particular. So, so when you looked at that on the commercial side, because that's something I always have trouble with, is just what their, their maximum allowable occupancy, and that really has a lot to do with the, 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 uh, the sanitary uh, credits on that. That's right. So oh. I used it basically for the restaurant, and it was it was based on a seat, ten gallons per day per seat, and then I I figured out how how much uh, gallonage um, it would take in order to um, have the additional. This was based on 1.75 acres because that was the average of the area of all of the lots in Southampton that were exceeded the one acre minimum requirement. So was that average that over, became, over, the, over a year because we have such seasonal fluctuation in that regard? No, I did not. Uh, I broke it down. Basically, I arrived at, I, I multiplied that, which was the way the engineers figured it out, at 300 gallons per day times okay. the acreage. Right. And then it gave me a certain allowable gallon. <laughs> there there are that restaurants that possibly could reconfigure within, without having to build. Let's say it's a 40-seat restaurant. They could change the table sizes and yes, get up to a 60-seat restaurant. Right. Definitely, but, and yeah. that would have an impact on this because and the cost of construction. We have seen that. I know when, so much when Bay Burger was uh, first opening, they purchased a Pine Barrens credit or a sanitary credit or two. So there was a, a need for that kind of thing. Right. Uh, there may be other restaurants that have tried to increase their seating yes. within an existing building. Correct. So, yeah, they but but, but yeah. not to discredit what you did, right. it sounds like that may not be the highest and best use of the credit. So. Right. Well, you know, we, we still came up with, based on just adding because of the 2 to 10 percent allowable Increase in the gross area. We did. There was a an add-on uh, value to that, and I arrived at um, actually two hundred and ten thousand for the non-residential. Huh? So I for the carriage it was um, that th this is all summarized in the uh, beginning of the report. 
Um, and I did apply a discount factor, but the carriage house was 200, the lot was 410, mm -hmm. the non-residential was 210, and then I took an average of all of them, the uh, analyses basically, and I came up with the 275. That's much higher than I was anticipating. Just because I just I was thinking Pine Barrens. Credit, yes, which exactly. Which typically go between seventy five thousand and one hundred thousand. But right. you can't there's a use, lot to evaluate. And here. you can't use Pine Barren credits to right. the canal. This is Southampton. And so this is lots the go prime. For a lot more here. Well, I mean, it's here. good news if you can actually get that number. So what? It, how, how many is like thirteen credits? Or? Fifteen point one three. Yeah, you've done this. I don't have to calculate. Fifteen point one three times two. your number is what? I can do it if you yeah. want. Two million. You didn't. Nobody's done that. <laughs> 15.13 times the 275,000? Yeah. That's 4,160,750. That would be an absolute yeah. home run for, <laughs> our, for our affordable housing program. <laughs> if we can see those numbers. I, uh, it, I'm i doubtful that we'll see uh, those Okay, numbers. so that's a, that's a discounting, you know. I, uh, uh, but if we don't, we can always look at the actual market conditions and adjust this, right? That's right. Okay. So did you do like a, a hypothetical there and once you did your valuation and look at our assessment and do you see, you know, did you see any discrepancy, you know, big changes in that? I mean, just to test your, your methodology. In terms of the values, um, for instance, on the, the lots, it was easy to see that because you're at 100% assessment on the lot values. So that's really, and, and the number that I started with, which was an average, um, and actually this could be updated, in fact, because this, this uh, analysis ended up ending in 2018. So now we have more data. And we could we could go and see if there were more sales to add to this that might end up changing it. But the average actually turned out to be about um, eight hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars for only over a little bit over an acre in size for the average lot sales. That's why I'm like I agree with Kathleen. I don't foresee that we will have a problem selling these. So that, I, that's I, the I point. hope you're right. I, well, you would know how many people. Or in a position or looking for development rights. If we're the only game in town, this is the, we're the only place you're going to be able to go to get these things. If you have some, if you have, if you know that lots of lots are looking for carriage houses, which I maybe they are, they'll should sell pretty easily. It's just been my experience. It's been very few people who dabble in this end of the real estate market. You know, we know of one who does this all the time, but, yeah, but it doesn't make a good certain, auction if you have one person. And it's only mm -hmm. been uh, for a certain program, which is our old file map program. There's actually two people right. who dabble in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but this is a larger program and really hasn't been uh, really been utilized. Could we promote it prior totally. to the auction so that people know? Because you, know, you may end up with one person buying them all, but you may end up with you know, somebody just really needs one, they'll, they'll bid on one, right? We, well, we've uh, put together a notice to bidder, and we're saying the minimum purchase is a half a development, right? Uh, but I agree with you, and as part of that notice to bidder, we have a draft that we've prepared, and I was thinking about that actually, is we, in that notice to bidder, we're going to describe what you can use these development rights for, so it is as a, you know, an advertising campaign to make sure that people know what this whole program's about. <clears throat> yeah, because it, it's difficult to explain and and difficult to understand. That may be why people shy away from it uh, because they don't really understand it. I, I, I'm just, you know, it's got to be laid out in really careful terms. Well, but, but we don't really, you know, east of the canal, unlike the Pine Barrens, they have a clearing house and all that stuff. We've had a bank. Right now, our policy has been utilized primarily to create affordable housing purposes. Mm -hmm. and, and the town board's uh, policy has been, if you're creating affordable housing unit, and usually it's for health department purposes, the board will give you the, provided that units in perpetuity is affordable. So that's been, but there hasn't been a big market, even in the, although some people do hold credits, and we, you know, there hasn't been a big market for uh, selling those credits outside the town's bank. 
I didn't hear any mention about clearing, and I know that that's a big deal for people. That you know, some some people they're very limited as to how much lot area they can clear. This would allow you to expand your clearing, wouldn't wouldn't it's, it? It's it, that's a little bit more great. You're absolutely right. The planning board uh, has taken as part of the site disturbance. Uh, plan that they can approve is the use of uh, Pine Barren, or not Pine Barren, of development rights. Pretty much is what they've, they've done though is they've, uh, the clearing has to be in proximity, a certain proximity to where the area that's cleared. Right. You can't take it. So there's no, it's really up to the planning board on oh, how they're Oh, it's not within the school district per se? So no, because no impact on the school district. So if you were close to the line, but they do, usually it's within, within an, a recharge area. No, typically it's usually within a mile of the site. Whatever site that's over cleared, they're not, they want to have that, uh, either they... Well, you'd want to know from the planning board, right, prior to purchasing, whether you'd be able to use that. That's right. And how, what's the trade-off? So obviously the, the development, right, ties back to a lot that isn't going to be cleared at all. That's correct. So we're basically taking some of that clearing. So how much of the clearing is transferable with the right? Well, it depends on what your lot size is. Our, our clearing restrictions are based on lot size. What do we so have you have to have at least a percent a, increase oh, or oh, oh, uh, uh, at least a one to one, you know, say if you're over cleared by 10,000 square feet. Whatever the lot that you're sending from, you have to have at least 10,000 square feet of clearing permitted on that sending site. So if you're sitting there and you're, you've overcleared mm -hmm. and you have a choice to revegetate, which is probably very expensive, or, or buy this credit, mm -hmm. transfer it, and then you could then enjoy that cleared area and that's not correct. have to revegetate it. All right, that's, that, right. that's valuable, I would mm -hmm. think, to certain people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. So people it's people have actually bought and didn't even use, I mean, it, the concept is the same, but they just buy fee simple, put a conservation easement on it, and then basically sometimes donate it to the town. They still hold, they don't have to necessarily, and then, and then transfer that, and that's through uh, approval by the planning board. Okay. We, we actually did a calculation in our allocation letter. Each development right from this property would uh, allow for 4,000 square feet of clearing. So after the auction, because you know the clearing thing is more complicated, and you need to know if it's within a mile or whatever, and mm -hmm. you need planning board approval. If after the auction we haven't sold all the credits, they could be still for sale, right? You come to us, absolutely, and purchase it as long as it's you know at the fair market value, right? We could sell them at fair market value. You're charged I, I, with selling them at fair market value. What? You're charged with selling them at fair market. Right. Don't be. Uh, you understand? Like after. Let's absolutely. let's say we sell yeah. four of these at auction. Them, absolutely. Leave them in the bank. Until we have them That's in a bank. bank. Yeah. You're, you're, giving, you, you're trying to breed some life into the bank. Yeah. Now here, my question is: Is how long does this market value stay into effect before the bank has to upgrade the market value? Mm, there's, you know. Six months to a year before you get an annual update. Yeah, get an update, exactly. Update. I agree with you. We would have to go through the same process of having it. Well, it, it would just be an update to right. the appraisal okay. because it's, the work has already been done. Exactly. So it wouldn't so be too difficult. It would be a much different right. yeah, procedure because you have the whole format now. And you'd also just take the data from exactly. that. Exactly. You're just that adding past up year. To, Right, exactly. Right. <clears throat> Yeah. Does it right. come with any sort of this is good I mean, for at least a just year. sort of thinking outside the box here as forms of incentive for if there is a development in this case for, towards alternative energies or control you know con, uh, condensing that cluster system you know all the things that we talk about doing is there a way to incentivize that when they purchase those credits and are working towards a, another affordable housing development. You mean if somebody came in for a change of zone or something? Yeah. Sure. I mean, again, you'd have the bank, right? So you could say you're coming in, and if the if the board felt it appropriate as part of a change of zone application, then you have to get a certain number of developments. So that would remain with the board. Mm -hmm. right. It can be a tool yeah. to yeah. help. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Offset densities yeah. that are there, you know, all those things. Right. Is it possible for an entity to come in to purchase all of them and then hold them? And not sell them and just extinguish them themselves. 
Absolutely. Yes, sure. Um, could they hold them and resell them? And that's the, that's a good question. Yeah. In other words, they somebody resell. goes in, they see oh, this sure. price, absolutely, and then yeah. they own them and. Right. Well, absolutely. Well, conversely, they take the risk that it would Still fall up. below. It's market. like a, you know holding a stock certificate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Yes. That's 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 risk intense in my view. Well, it's a cost of money. The, you know, the, the, money the, the the price of land's not going down. Right, so basically that As development right is one lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one lot worth two hundred seventy-five thousand in the Southampton so, School District. Certainly in Southampton, it's mm -hmm. not. Yeah, I mean this is the prime well, of the prime, really. Well, Southampton School District, sure. Yeah, yeah, we haven't s seen any devaluation in a long time. So there's no no transfer to the CBF one. <laughs> <laughs> no. Mm, all right, just just think it out loud. No, and that's where that well, would be complicated because that was the first thought with this Conklin property right. is to just have the CPF fund buy the two thirds that it hadn't, and we couldn't do that because the CPF fund cannot buy land that's owned by the town. I don't think the CPF fund could buy development rights that were owned by the town either. So, right? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Although, if we if our Sold water quality land. board acquires properties for uh, installation of cluster systems and so forth there I could see where there might be some little friction relative to the CPF law and that's if somebody wanted to actually produce put in a septic or a cluster system as a third party to serve a, a dead snake I never mind I'm, I'm thinking in another <laughs> space all right um, so so what's next? We have a value. We have now. We hold an auction. Yes, we uh, we have uh, prepare a resolution. to be in two weeks. We could put it on to release the notice to bidders. Okay, and then we uh, we hope that we get our number. Okay, and the Anna will be very happy. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, and if we don't we'll get our be, number, we'll then we revisit. That's the what I was just going to ask you. Yeah. 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 Yeah, then we revisit it. But I think right. the best thing to do before we devalue it is to really try to promote it. Yeah. Make sure everybody knows the value, why this is a good thing. Um, it, it's interesting when you set a value for, for something. Let's say you're trying to do a carriage house. You cannot do it for any amount of money. Right? You can't build a carriage house. If you're, let's say, on a five-acre lot, zone five-acre lot, you've got your estate, you want to do a carriage house, you're out of luck. You, you put a million dollars, you're out of luck. Five million dollars is out, out of luck. But with this credit, you can do it. So it's very valuable. So it could be it could be very valuable yeah. to the right to the right, person, right. In the right person, yeah, right in the that's right, right condition. Yeah. Exactly. So there's not like another way to get there. This is the only way to get there. Uh, a variance a possibly. A variance from the zoning board. Thank you. Yeah. Might be another way to do it. Um, no guarantee. There is a provision in 331.67 when somebody comes to the ZBA that they need it to create an undersized lot or that they need to demonstrate it, that uh, the variance can't be obtained unless there is, uh, that there are no development rights within the school district that they are. Right, you're supposed to. That's part of the law, and that's why we have it in 330. You can't achieve it exactly by another means that you've exhausted other possibilities. Yeah, which we should make sure the zoning board is aware of that they, because they the planning could, board tells them all they could be devaluing. <laughs> they could devalue our credits. Yes, by handing out yes. variances. Right. That's right. Issuing. <laughs> handing out. <laughs> Issuing. <laughs> Kathleen, were you going to say something about that? No. No. About the planning board? Okay. So, all right. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So let's go ahead. Let's let's forge ahead. Thank you, Thank Eleanor. You, you as are always, very welcome. Uh, very it was a very, lot of work. Uh, right. It was an uh, interesting project. A very interesting <laughs> one. Great. You well know, stated. Great methodology. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very, you. Really, uh, that's why we like you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. It was a pleasure to meet everybody and see everyone again. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, this was a complicated task. 
that you took on. That's why it's taken a while. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The unforeseen. All right. Do some updates. Oh, 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 because 11 is our next thing? Yeah, Kyle's going to get Janice. I could, sure, let me. I got to stay out for one second. Um, um, so let me pass these out. This is a good ground park on stage. This is the schedule of uh, performances and other events at good ground park for 2019. Tommy John, thank you for you. Looks like this is coming out of CRC. I'll take one. Let's see what we've got here. Starting May 4th. Oh, that's got changed. The, the Earth Day is moved from May 4th to uh, May 18th. So uh, Earth, Earth Day Festival. I guess it's, it may rain this weekend. So uh, they're, they're switching the Earth Day Festival at Good Ground Park to May 18th. Uh, but there's other events in May too. The Spring Migration Bird Walk on the 11th, Candlelight. Oh, on uh, also on the 11th that night, 7 p.m. There's a the second opioid uh, vigil. This was really a powerful event that was held last year, where uh, really in honor of all those who lost their lives uh, to the opioid epidemic. Um, you know, it's often these people unfortunately die in the shadows. Uh, people are uncomfortable or there's such a stigma around opioid use and addiction that um, there's very little, um, you know, and it, it's basically just people seem to move on without really having closure. And, um, so we had this candlelight vigil last year and a, a lot of people came out and told stories about brothers they lost or sisters or mothers or children, and some of them said this is like the first time they've ever talked about their son, and he was a good kid who got hooked on a s extremely addictive substance. And there were tears, and, and there were hugs, and uh, it was a lot of support, uh, you know, and we had resources there, people there who could help. And, uh, you know, I, I felt like it drew people into this circle who, we're not maybe coming to our um, forums that we were holding that were more educational and you know where we were talking at the audience this was really uh everybody coming onto the stage and just sharing and uh it was really moving we set up 400 candles in a little like those tea light candles for uh, all the victims in Suffolk County of the OP for the for the prior year, and then we had um, we had this a circle um, of 19 candles, uh, larger candles for uh, all those who had died in the town of Southampton that year, and then we also added a candle in the center for we had at that point one opioid death last year. Um, so we had these three circles, and then of course, outside that were the circle of people um, gathered. And it was fairly, it was a little rainy that night. That didn't seem to stop anybody. Um, I don't know the outer ring anymore. I know that the Suffolk County, the death toll uh, went down from that 400 number. In uh, that was from 2017. So 18 is is down. Um, I know we. Dropped uh, significantly too. We went from that 19 down to six. We had six deaths, six too many, but um, and we have also had a death this year. So uh, I believe we're going to do the same thing with the candles. But uh, you know, I urge the board to come to that. It's a really, uh, it's a really nice, a really nice event. Uh, we might have some music. It'll be very light, like acoustic. Um, more meditative it was a really a really nice event and then also in may on the 29th is senior health and fitness day um, from 11 from 10 to 1 co-sponsored by the southampton senior center you know and you know i guess at some of these updates i'll tell you more um, about other events as they get closer but lots of great music nancy atlas is coming back um, 
She's, I know, very popular, and uh, we've got the Eagle River Band. Uh, they played recently at a benefit out here. They're an Eagles band, and lots of movie nights, and uh, lots of great events at Good Ground Park. So um, that's that. Let me pass this around. Uh, this is for a ribbon cutting coming up for Pong Quad Pavilion. It's coming out great. Um, this is going to be, uh, weather permitting, uh, on Monday, May 20th, 2019, at 11 a.m. And uh, there's going to be coffee and some, uh, some new foods. There is going to be a concession there. I don't know if it will be open for that, but they'll be providing food. I believe it's, uh, the concession is tied in with uh, Docker somehow. It's the same, same people. Um, but the new beach, it's not a new pavilion, it's been there, but the refurbished, renovated pavilion, uh, Monday, May 20th. This is open to anyone. I know some people had some concerns mm -hmm. that it was in, an invite only. It's not an invite only. Yeah, we're just trying to get a number on who may be attending, but anybody can attend. Right, just so Our we can kind of have enough food to go around. Right. right? But uh, please join us. This is, this is a, a community facility and the board... Uh, has been really committed to uh, fixing it up. It hadn't been really touched since the 60s, but now it's going to feel like a brand new beach pavilion. So, uh, And the deck is much larger. It's 30% increase in the deck. It's all <coughs> EPE lumber. The parking area, I don't know, has that been done too? I haven't been down there in a while. I haven't been down there either. <coughs> I have to check, but uh, there were a lot of elements to this uh, capital project that we did, and uh, by all accounts, it's really coming out well. So come join us. All right, um, other updates. I've got, I got a note from the trustees of the Bridgehampton Museum. So they have been, you know, we've been working on the Nathaniel Rogers House, and I, I probably should talk about this more when Lisa Combrink is here. Um, We've been using CPF funds to repair the Nathaniel Rogers House, but the, there's a group of trustees that have been raising money for all the things that are non-CPF. And they've raised a significant amount of money. The architect that's working on this, we basically staged this in two stages. Um, there, we were going to do the, the cupola <laughs> later and the balustrades um, later we're being told by the architect that that's going to add a substantial amount to the cost to do that later um, because they'll have to roof it now and then they'll have to cut a big hole into the roof um, so they are asking us to go ahead and pay we were going to pay for those things but to pay it now rather than later so we don't end up with an extra cost so um, in the cost of the cupola and the balustrades, uh, well, the cupola is 150000 and the balustrades are 350000 So it's a half a million dollars in expense from the CPF program. Uh, what I don't know is if we can do it this year because, as you guys are aware, there's only a certain amount of CPF dollars that can go toward these kinds of projects in a given year. And uh, if we've already hit that, I think it's a 10%. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Up so, to 10%. I'm sorry? 10 up to 10%. Up to 10%. Yeah. So we need an accounting first to know if this is something that we can do this year. If we can do it, then we have to decide whether we want to do it. Uh, you, you know, it is a beautiful building. Uh, you know, the costs are, uh, I, I think, have been higher than anybody would have anticipated. Uh, partly, I think, because they are painstakingly restoring this building to very precise historical standards. And uh, it has added to the cost at the end of the day. Oh, and, and here's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. I actually jumped in on, a, on something that I could use you on. Sorry to throw you right in. Um, I'm talking about the Nathaniel Rogers House. I circulated a memo that the architect... Um, has said that if we wait on the cupola and the balustrades that, although that's something that we plan to fund, we were going to do it as a second phase and they're saying that's going to add substantial cost to it because they'll have to reopen the roof. They'll have to close the roof, finish the roof, and then cut the hole for the cupola and I guess do whatever they have to for the balustrades. Um, 
and I think the balustrades encircle the square, the flat roof. So um, the first question, though, before we can decide whether this is uh, something we want to fund now rather than later, is whether we have maxed out on CPF. So we're only allowed to spend up to 10% in a given year on it. I don't know if that's something you've had an opportunity to even look at. I haven't. I do have the numbers, though. I have to look at them more carefully. But I, my understanding is that CPF cannot pay for this portion of the project. So. Oh, really? I'll confirm you mean that. it doesn't yes. meet the history? I don't think so. Oh, it I thought it did. Something to do did. with when it was. It, was, it wasn't there. <laughs> Okay. At the at the you know at the relevant time period. Okay. Well, so CPF cannot pay for that. And oh, okay. That's that changes a lot because it's historically out of sync and chronology of the chronology. Building. Right now, the other thing is that we have litigation right. with one of the vendors, so I need to discuss that with you in executive session. I think and how that might relate to this. Okay. So. Okay. Well, that's that's important. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I, th you know, based on the memo, I thought that CP, this was something CPF was anticipating and could pay for, but we're going to do it as a phase two. Uh, so let's get, let's make sure on that. And uh, if not, you know, we'll have to go back to right. the trustees of the, the Berchanta Museum and maybe they can raise the money for it. I, I don't know. Um, or we we can discuss using non-CPF money, but um, and figure out when the appropriate time is for that. Okay. Okay. Understood. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, so, Jan, I just saw Janice. I think she's here. She's on her way. Okay. So um, let me see if there's any other updates that I can do real quick. Um, I'll remind the public that we do have the South Fork Commuter Connection running. We have uh, you know two trains in the morning heading eastbound and two trains uh, heading heading westbound in the in the afternoon and uh, if you want to avoid the traffic and the traffic is building up every day um, you have a great way to do it. it's very affordable and very convenient and we do have the shuttle service that will take you from the train station. Uh, to your place of work for, for most people. So uh, it's a great program and we urge people to take advantage of it. Um, one other update, uh, sort of related to sitting in traffic on Sunrise Highway there, as the board is aware at this point, the uh, Shinnecock Nation is progressing an economic development project to create uh, what they call monuments, two monuments, one on the north side and one on the south side of Sunrise Highway. They are 61 foot tall structures. Um, they have the Shinnecock Nation's emblem illuminated in the top portion and then a 20 foot by 30 foot illuminated uh, electronic billboard, like a, you know, like a giant TV screen. So allow for moving advertising. They plan to sell advertisements on these things. They are well into construction. They have been out there. We. Uh, our, uh, the board has submitted a, a letter to the Shinnecock Nation asking them to, uh, to halt construction, that we feel that they're out of character with our community uh, and certainly violate the spirit of our, uh, our laws that are, you know, limit the height of structures and prevent light pollution. Um, we have issued a, a, a stop work order, which is being ignored. Uh, we have reached out. Uh, at multiple levels to uh, state DOT, uh, the Federal Highway Administration, uh, various uh, elected leaders at the state and uh, federal level. And, uh, you know, we are researching many things pertaining to this. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but progress seems to be continuing unabated. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, there was, I did have a meeting. Uh, Tommy John was in attendance uh, with members of the Tribal Council. It was really, you know, from their perspective, just to inform us of what their plans were. And uh, well, I did get a, a text yesterday that uh, on one of the questions about whether they'd be illuminated all the time, 
Um, they are telling me now that after a certain hour, the, the light levels will be diminished significantly. Uh, but other than that, uh, this is uh, this is what they plan to do, and uh, we're looking at our options. They believe these are sovereign lands, that uh, although not part of the reservation, that uh, they have been owned by the Shinnecock Nation for a long time, and they believe that they're exempt or immune from our regulations. Uh, it is frustrating. Uh, I've been trying to appeal to the kind of the conscience of the Shinnecock people to work with us on economic development plans that will improve their uh, living conditions that don't detract from our scenic beauty. And the, the, I think what draws so many people from all over the world to come to our area, to visit our area, enjoy our area, uh, to build their primary residences and their summer homes. And uh, it's unfortunate. Um, I think a lot of people um, are upset now and I think they'll perhaps be more upset as these signs continue to be erected. But uh, I just want to make sure that the board and the public are, are kept in the loop here. Uh, we are doing what we can. Jim, I was just talking about the, uh, just updating the board on the uh, progress of the electronic billboards yes. or Shinnecock yeah. sure. monuments right. that are being constructed. Yeah. You may see these giant poles going up. Mm -hmm. um, those poles are the, that pole, a single pole on each side is the main support structure. And then the, uh, there are cross members and then the, the signs appear to be attached then to those cross members. And I believe that the sign, looking at the schematics, they're sort of at slight angles like this with the cross member in the middle, with the, with the main pole rather here. And then they sit like this. It's mm -hmm. um, Again, you all know my feelings about this. It's very upsetting, and uh, yeah. we're doing what we can. Jim, is there anything else you wanted to add on that? No, they just said we're waiting. We've been in communication, obviously, with the state DOT and with the Federal Highway Administration, the attorneys down there. I've been in constant communication with Federal Highway uh, attorneys, and they are in communication with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to try to determine the status of the subject property, and that will determine whether they feel the state has the ability to enforce the uh, billboard, the federal highway law. Uh, so uh, we're waiting for that uh, at this moment. I've been giving them as much information as I have so they can help make, the, make that determination. So, so we'll see. Anybody have any questions for Jim or I? No, this? just that the Shinnecocks are proceeding under the, the concept that the local governments, uh, the town and the county have no jurisdiction. Right. Right. So, um, like right. uh, the counselors, that, like right. Jim said, that you know yeah. we're waiting for action from the state if yeah. possible. Yeah, the state has the responsibility, of jurisdiction, typically, on to enforce billboards to outdoor advertising on areas such as this uh, that within within 600 feet of a public highway like this. So it's typically the state's responsibility under the Federal Highway Act to enforce uh, this type of uh, application. Yeah, the the threat of losing federal funds if they don't. So but the question is, though, can it, do they have the authority uh, in this situation because of the tribal lands or not? And so, so we are waiting for a determination from Bureau of Indian Affairs on that as we speak. Okay, so, um, so we're waiting on Janice, sure. So let me see if there's anything else I can update you guys on. Um, I have something. Uh, Okay, tell me, John, you want to go ahead? Sure. On, on May 18th, the Southampton Arts and Cultural Committee, we are going to be taking a trip to the Parish Art Museum as well as the Dan Flavin Art Institute. Um, that is open to the public. We're going to be leaving at 10 o'clock. Um, you should be very interested. So if you are interested in, in uh, going on this tour, you can call my <coughs> office or uh, go online and contact us and, and get a seat on the bus. Or if you would like to take your own car, you could do that as well. Um, wh where is it going to? The Parish Art Museum and the Dan Flavin Art Institute. Where's the Dan Flavin Art? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> okay. It's in the area. In, in, yeah, nearby, as I understand. Yeah. Okay. I've never been there, and so I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> no, that's Good morning. That's great. Is, and it's free for the yes. public? It's free? free. The public. Is, there, is there lunch for the um, I don't know. The last one, we did have lunch, and we are working on that. Okay. That's great, Tommy John. Now, give me the date one more time. May 18th. May 18th. Exactly. All right. 
All right, so now we're going to switch gears. If you could just wait two minutes, I'm just waiting All right, for two minutes. to come to you. All right, let me see if I have another update of any kind. Um, well, John, you and I were at Senator Laval's Environmental Roundtable. That was, uh, he, Senator Laval hosts this every year at the Culinary Institute out at uh, Suffolk County Community College in Riverhead. And it's a, a great opportunity for elected officials to sort of hear from the movers and shakers in the environmental community about mm -hmm. different issues. I mean, one of the issues that sort of came up more than I've seen in the past was waste management, not just uh, uh, sanitary waste from septic systems, but solid waste and recycling. And what are we going to do with all the garbage? And how do we reduce packaging materials and mm -hmm. you know, have less waste to process? Yeah. Um, that that was interesting. There was a, you know, it was a, a good conversation. Lots of people were there. It's a it's a big room, and the table, kind of, is probably as big as this room right here in terms of it goes all the way around the perimeter, and you have different people sitting at the table, people like Kevin McDonald and Bob DeLuca and Andrew Spilka and. Um, all different environmental organizations, Adrian Esposito from Citizens Campaign for the Environment. And as well as staff from DEC and state yeah. and uh, federal. Cornell Cooperative so. Extension was there. Lots of different environmental councils. and uh, It's a nice event to be able to attend. So Well, it's, I thought it's really informative. I and mean, I think you're right. Uh, you know, we do discuss the waste, waste stream issue quite a lot. It's becoming more and more uh, burdensome to local municipalities. So talking about shared services and all, I, I'm heartened that a lot of local municipalities are considering uh, some of the legislation that Councilman Lobstad had, put, uh, had entered here for Southampton in an efforts to, to reduce our waste stream. So I think You're talking about the plastic straw ban, which yeah. got a lot of applause from the yeah, it did. from the table for and that. It was, you know, representing globally, you know, some 30% by volume in our waste stream. I think it's a, a huge savings, particularly for the transport costs and all the other issues. But that I'll have to on that issue, though, that's next Wednesday, right? That goes the May 8th. Yeah. May. So next Wednesday, that law is in effect. So go ahead, John. Um, yeah, I mean, relative to that issue, the, the, the environmental impacts, obviously, and there was a, a lot of discussion, some discussion about um, some sidebar conversations about vegetative waste management, the efforts that we're trying to do here, and the fact that some uh, trying to establish uh, a better chain of custody for understanding what's contained in that vegetative waste. So sometimes it's not just vegetative waste, but things get into it through one reason or another, and there's some concerns about that. The farming community uh, uh, talks a, a lot about being able to, we're having trouble getting rid of this material sure. or using it in a responsible way, putting it back on fields, uh, putting, giving it to the uh, farming community, but it needs to, you know, be understood that that material has a certain content and certain testing measurements that go into it to make that happen so that it doesn't just become a place for uh, waste material to get aggregated into it and then put on to back into the environment. So and of course the processing of vegetative waste relates to our conversation about water quality, yes. which we can now segue into CPF water quality you, proposals. You were doing, I just want to add one more thing <laughs> oh, before you, yeah, you try to get away with it. Um, the, I thought I, I stalled long enough. Yeah, I no. Well, I'm, I got a better segue. We, okay. Uh, the, uh, I sit on the uh, Sandy Superstorm Sandy Task Force and we just finished the document. Hooray! It's a long 18 months. I, I think it has turned into a, a really good document. And I just, I, I'm going to pat myself on the back because we talked about this. I gave a, a lot of, uh, it was hard to get people from the western part of the town to understand the needs and the different needs that we have here relative to coastal resiliency, storm resiliency, and, and so forth. And I, I think, I hope, that uh, we got that strongly enough uh, stated in this document uh, when it comes up for public review. So um, I think we put ourselves on the map at least relative to, to the issues that are important to us. And I just uh, you know, wanted to thank all the members on that task force. They were, they worked hard, and I feel a little beat up, but I survived. So um, this is a countywide task force. Yes, it is. So, yeah. Okay. So that's the segue to uh, Ms. Shearer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good okay. morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so I really wanted um, Lisa and I, you know, since she's our new CPF 
program manager and has kind of come in at the middle of this round, so to speak. Uh, we talked about like processes, and as you know, we're always looking to improve our process and be, you know, equitable and transparent and all these things. So, so we thought the today I really I'm not here to really tell you everything about these projects. It's more about like how you want to. It's more policy and how you want to do this um, and process, and so you understand what we got, and then how to move fo move forward, and that's what I just want to talk to you about today. And then, obviously, each of these applicants would like to speak to you directly and present their projects and have questions in a public forum where there would be a public hearing and you can decide. But getting to that public hearing is really the question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want? to have some kind of elect to consider situation where you decide whether they move forward or do, you know the advisory committee has its recommendations last time we batched them all and put them forward these are much more complicated and deserve their own time so they need public hearings that they are able to provide that information to you so you can understand and then of course we're going to give you our memo of recommendations and funding recommendations as well so I just wanted to tell you what we've got and then sort of tell you what seems like it's ready to go, what we're still talking to the applicants about, and then we can talk about, you know, how you want to move these through the process, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I grouped this spreadsheet into the different types of projects that we have, and the three main categories, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> can I see something? Yeah. This goes from stormwater. I see oh, wastewater water. treatment. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. I'm all right. Okay. Yeah, Little moment of water. panic. I thought <laughs> one of my columns didn't happen. The blue is different. It didn't print out well. So the first group is stormwater pro stormwater treatment projects. Then we have wastewater treatment projects, and then we have aquatic habitat restoration. Yeah, I see. They're not all the same. They're not all the same blue. So for a minute, I just had a panic attack. That a page was missing. Relax. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay, Janet. sighs> Thank okay. Take a deep breath. So I also had a map prepared so you can see like where these projects and what areas we're talking about across the town are, are being proposed. Um, they're not in any specific order, but when we go through them here, I'll point them out on the map too. So the first one I have on here is um, called the Alwife Creek Enhancement Project. And this is um, up in Noyak Road area. It's labeled by number five here, North Sea Road, Noyak Road. And um, this is being proposed by the highway superintendent, and they got a grant from New York State, um, Consolidated Funding Award grant, but it required a match. There was a resolution by you that authorized the grant application, so they're asking now for the CPF to pay for that match. Um, Where is this? This is in North Sea. North Sea Road. It's basically they want to modify um, an existing culvert to right size it so that alewives can run through the the fish habitat and do some. Ha it's all. It's kind of both. It's habitat restoration and stormwater. So drainage. is there a, the, the scientific basis for this? I, I would suggest discussing this with Joyce Novak at PEP just before we don't have you know. Oh yeah, they all endorsed it. Okay. PEP, CTOC. Okay. We have. They've submitted okay. letters of endorsement. Um, and that would be useful to know on these things as you bring them forward. So, you know, we, we all see different things that are happening here and there, and just to be sure there's no conflict in what, you know, what we're... Okay. Is this the culvert helping. that was collapsing? I oh, don't know if it was collapsing, but uh, no, that's Trout Pond. Yeah, Trout Pond. But is, this is um, this is like a culvert, and I don't want to represent. Like that's kind of what I want. Right. Like I want them to be able to come in and explain it and show you all the pictures. I just want to make sure it's not oh, like a standard infrastructure replacement and highway that is being proposed as a water quality. It's project. definitely a fresh fish it's friendly a, enhancement for uh, enhancement for these alewives too. And they, from what I, my understanding, and again. It's going to be them that shows tells you this, but they want to make this like box culvert, which has like the bottom of the culvert is like like fish habitat, and then the alewives are able to get through it. And this whole grant was approved by the state. Basically, it's been vetted through the state for this purpose as a water quality project, okay. and this is the match. So, so they the also. Metric? I'm trying to, and I guess they'll t talk to us about that. I don't want to get into the grass, but I'm try just trying to understand 
the metric involved with yes and that's but yeah and that's what i'm saying like i okay. don't want to get into like me describing all these projects and so that's the thing like do you pound want of each nitrogen these guys per to, dollar yeah. yeah do you want each one of these entities to come to you in a work session format do you think they should go to public hearing and describe this? One you know more what i mean detail like for certain we have the applications of course right. and i want to give you those but i just want to understand what we're getting and then you decide how you kind of want it to be. So this is, it um, looks like a $610,000 It started as a four hundred and ten, which would be the match for the total grant. Then they went out there, after they met with the advisory committee and we asked them a million questions, they went back out there and they went with a drone and they were looking at, because they have an engineering firm doing this. Uh, it's not just the highway superintendent, it's, it's really L.K. McLean is doing this work. They went out there and looked they're, at it. They're the consultants to the highway department. Yes. So okay. they went so out I don't, there. All right. I'm, see, that's the kind of thing that I'm just confused about because I don't know where the expertise stops and starts relative to. As it. an engineering project, they put forward the grant application okay. um, to the state, and so we um, that they realize that there's um, an, a significant amount of sediment. Now you might decide you only want to pay for the match and not this extra component that the head wall. Of this well, I just was about to ask that I, whether that qualifies. I don't know. And that mm -hmm. they just literally asked me yesterday, can we add it on? So that's why I don't have enough information. We're going to meet with them again. So, you know, so. And this well, is the kind oh, of thing that you would like some direction on when people come to you and ask, or people, entities or individuals ask for different amounts of money. Well, so, yeah, I mean, we want to understand how you want to handle this. Like, I have my ideas, but that I'm, just, I'm so far last time, we've done this once. <laughs> we did the one round. We batched them together because they were relatively simple projects. That, and we did it all as one public hearing. These are now more significant projects and they each require some level of scrutiny in and of themselves. So but you did have televised forward. meetings with the applicants individually. That we did that last time. This time we just had more informal interviews and we feel the televised presentations belong in front of you. You know what I well, mean? Well, they, they were in front of at least me. Well, So that's why I'm saying I, I actually learned a lot from watching that exchange and not being in the room. Right. We didn't do it that way this time because we thought they would do that for you so you can hear it and understand it. Well, I'm a little unclear. Have all these been vetted by the Water Quality Committee? We've reviewed all of them and scored them and rated them. Now right, the question so all is these how do we bring them by forward? The water well, I, they're not, we're going to give you a recommendation memo. And they may not be approved to the level they're asking for. So and you're saying that, and the two hundred thousand additional that the highway su superintendent has requested, that has not been vetted. At not all. yet, no. So we need to have an additional meeting to look at that. I mean, as an example, with the, the West Hampton Beach project, you know, there was an administrative component of that that we didn't feel was was uh, was appropriate to pay for 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 the fund so we took that out i mean we right oh yeah we're going to make those recommendations when you get to see the proposal and you can you know we're not at that stage yet we're, no i'm just trying we've to we've vetted them all and we've scored them all just so you know where we've what we've done so far may, may i also ask? want to make sure that um as we go forward we're we're having a process that you all want to have and that's really the purpose of being here it's it's how you want it to go it's not just we said so, you saw, you know, if you want it that way, that's fine. But I thought these are more significant and may require more scrutiny from you. Are, uh, and are any of these multi-year? Most of them are multi-year. Well, are some of them are not. So let me just go through them. Okay. Can I just ask, figure well, it out. how much money is available? So that I'm, I'm assuming we're going to have to prioritize, or maybe not, if there's enough money available. So that's another question. That's a big question. So the uh, application <laughs> of its... What is it, 20% mm -hmm. of CPF revenues from the prior year? Prior is that or the year two years ago? It's so it's about, it's, it basically, um, let's just assume for argument's sake, it's around $10 million. Okay. Um, but you reserved $4 million off the top of that for uh, oh, yeah. water main extensions no, okay. in, in East Quag for the PFOA, PFOS yeah. situation. You also have $2 million encumbered for okay. IA systems, so, so now so you're down to six. Four. We have land acquisitions that are pending that we need to keep money. As, you know, these things take, well, take for time. Right. Water quality, for land water quality for for Riverside and uh, easements and things like that, which you've. How much is on that list? Uh, I would set aside like 
one to two because we're trying to obtain the, the right, wetland so parcels. Say, uh, up to eight million, that leaves two million. Left. Means uh, about two million for and this the purpose. IA system installation. Is that That's yeah, covered that the in the two, two million. million. Yeah. So you have about two million. This, two if you were to approve million. everything, adds up to about that. But there's some things that on here that well, I'm going to tell you about that really don't necessarily belong here now. Right. So so okay. let me just get through this and then you okay. can decide I you know and I don't mean to confuse you. It's I'm slightly confused. <laughs> we just want to make a really good process. And so uh, right and the committee met twice uh, over a two week period and probably you know had these interviews divided basically in half so spent probably four to five hours meeting with the different applicants and they're all really good yeah, projects I, I, and I'm, worth your time to hear them propose them to you you know we don't want to be the only ones they all right so let's go through so, let's just go through. Down, so this one yeah i this. just i i felt the process was pretty good <laughs> before so you know it sounds to me like the only thing that you might be suggesting is that the applicants appear in front of us personally rather than we view it uh, through the televised correct. Your, your televised correct. system I think that and I also think some of these may be uh, worth having a work session with the applicant and some may just be straight to public hearing and let them have a presentation with you and you'll advise us of those and I'm going to tell you right now which ones oh, okay. I think are right. work session worthy and which ones I think should go to public hearing and which ones I think need to wait and, and need to so, decide on that process yes all right so let's try to get through I'll just kind of get through we'll, this we'll probably okay. interrupt you a little bit but that's fine and um, so that's the Alewife Life Creek enhancement project we think that at least the part that's been vetted by the state the is match piece. the match piece is something that you should consider um, we can have it as a public hearing or a work session. It's at your dis whichever one you okay. want to do. So that's not in but here. You're going, to, you're going to bring us that back in writing. So you know, I when you decide which way you want to go, we're, I'm going to give you a comprehensive memo of all our recommendations as far as funding awards and et cetera. All okay. of these are have. I'm going to tell you verbally. Yeah, no, I get that. It's just there's a lot of. You know, There's a lot of moving parts, and so you can understand my uh, mm -hmm. hesitation to okay. make these judgment calls without you. All right. Uh, Thank you. Sure. I mean, it's really at your your board. So, um, so you're up to the second one. The second one is straightforward. This is easy. Uh, Village of Southampton, they're plugging away at their Lake Agawam management plan. This is just a simple drainage infrastructure project like we just saw on Job's Lane. This is just continuing it down. Um, and they're putting in drainage infrastructure to capture stormwater runoff. You approve them of 292,000 last year this year they're asking for 211,000 I would recommend they just go to public hearing uh, oh yeah so on that uh, it seems like a lot of the water is sort of captured and sent toward Lake Agua so what are we doing here we're not are we now filtering it yeah or? we've asked them to put filters into the drainage okay that's what basin. it is yep it's not only putting the catch basin it's also inserting filters and then okay. they have a Those are sediment somewhere. catches. Yeah, yeah like yeah. they're called Fabco or equivalent company. Which it would appear that runoff is, and you know that's where I'll get into the details. That the runoff is a, a, a large factor involved in the problems. That so the happen. water runs off now. You're catching it, but when you catch the water now, you're filtering it also. So you're Perfect. getting it two. And those are the in-place filters. Or it runs straight into the lake, have and they, you're getting it. Are runs. they committed in the village to? changing filtration media because yes. you're, you're pulling out hydrocarbons and other things right right but you need to change that filter filter they in, said they uh, have the management and operational budget to do it um, so okay. you so it's actually a very right. Right. they will handle the maintenance they handle the, the maintenance right. they handle everything okay. about it um, and they're that's committed great. to that okay and it's an interesting system and that's you know that's the part I would like to hear more about right and that's what I'm saying like some of this is something that you should hear about more than just us yeah. Um, okay, Great. so this one's easy. This next one is something that was an error, as we've seen the last time. The Village of Sag Harbor, as you know, last round you approved a series of rain gardens and various mm -hmm. drainage for their downtown. All the numbers add up, but the bottom line number, they wrote 264. It was actually 22,000. They wrote the wrong number on the bottom. And all of us reviewed it a million times over, and no one really So we underfunded them? We underfunded we had, them by 22,000. We 22, approved 000. the project, but we didn't give enough to complete it. Right. So that's pretty <laughs> much straightforward, but it would still require a public hearing. Um, okay. All right. Nice. So now next is, now we're under the category of wastewater treatment projects. Um, the first one is Bridgehampton Beach Club. 
<coughs> Bridgehampton Beach Club is actually a nonprofit um, down um, by Ocean Road, if mm -hmm. you know it. And they are doing a brand new IA system installation there. They've asked for grant monies for that cause. Um, on what a, on the basis of what flow rates? They we've worked that out. Uh, we have a recommendation lower than this amount based on the flow rate. Okay. It's about sixty six thousand is what we'll recommend because we normalized it. What is the occupancy the that it's based on? I know? honestly didn't. I can tell you. I just have I I have just an aside here. A little concern, you know, seeing Hampton Coffee where they 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 applied for a system that ended up costing them almost a hundred thousand dollars because of changes that were made on a, on a seemingly lower occupancy than that so I think this is an area that we need to be really cautious sure. about and we have and we have PW grocer that can come in and talk about it but well we, it was it was more it the change them. orders that came from um, on the well, and Bridgehampton Beach Club is really an open air pavilion, so it's really just the bathroom. You know, it's already it's not. Is this you know, a little, That's like what I'm saying. Is it, it does it qualify under residential septic? Um, no, it qualifies because, under commercial. Are they mandated to put in a system, or is this a voluntary project? This is a voluntary well, project. Yeah. They're not adding more than 25% of floor area, and it's not a new structure. Are they doing an addition? Doing they're ju they are, but it's uh, like an open air. It falls under the 25%. It falls so under they're the not project. required to do this? No. It's a high no, priority No, so you want to encourage them to. But it, although it's to. a not-for-profit, it is a fairly exclusive facility. Isn't yes. It? Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, this has to be something that These this is a policy decision about. for well, you. Well, it's also, I mean, it's I, that's why I wanted to make sure that it was uh, something that they were doing. Uh, voluntary, not uh, mandated. They were telling us, you know, we've had the same septic system since the 60s and we're happy and now they're, you know, maybe the health, may, may be mandated because the health department is telling them they need an IA, but the health yeah, department really? doesn't know, I don't they think they have authority. That. So uh, they, um, now well, they want to do the IA, they want to do the right Particularly in the watershed where it's in. Is, yeah. Is it going to increase the number of tables? Or? They are increasing kitchen capacity, but we've, we've adjusted for that the committee so our recommendation is going to reflect that I want to take a little more careful look at this absolutely the other thing I know they, they have water on both sides of them or just the ocean side just the ocean side Did I bring the plans? and the reason why I say that is you know we got we only have a limited number of dollars yeah and you know the ocean you know though it's a, it's it's a nice idea to you know, to remove nitrogen from all sanitary systems, um, you know, the inner harbors and bays and wetlands are where we have a much larger problem. The ocean really, because right. the ocean's a saltwater body and, you know, the but, free... The sorry free, to interrupt you, but that's why we have a water quality board to make those determinations and well, we'll you, get you that in. You could prioritize how you want. Yeah. You know, well, well, just, uh, but I'd like to hear I'm it. just weighing that in. Yeah. Just as, yeah. No, it's something that's definitely a, talked you know, about. As a chemistry major, mm -hmm. so, you know, people have salt water pools. Right. They do it for a reason. Chlorine ion, you know, displaces the hydrogen ion on the nitrogenous waste and volatilizes it. That's why the ocean doesn't particularly have a uh, a nitrogen problem. We asked them for updated information to tell us if the groundwater flows to Mecox Bay here, and they're going to give us that information. That would be a big we, difference. Yeah. We, yeah. And thought, we need we that. The same thing. And that's so we said, something we, we fought know for. The groundwater modeling here, and they said they would give us that. So this is we're a waiting little for the premature. Still, still, we don't still. know if this is ready because we haven't gotten that information. Okay. So it's something I'd want to look that. at, but yeah. I, you know, I, I don't I, I don't want to uh, diminish the proposal if they're voluntarily looking to upgrade their sanitary system but it sounds like there may be some benefits additional seats and things like that it is not although it's a not-for-profit it's very different than you know I other not-for-profits that's this why is, i want to hear the whole recommendation you know, from is, the yeah. board this is a highly <laughs> before exclusive right. membership club absolutely they did point out to us um that there is a conservation easement on this property uh to peconic land trust so i wanted to confirm that they could in fact do a small expansion and also change the infrastructure and they are permitted under the easement we just wanted to make sure so this is what i'm so saying like we have a couple more easement, things yeah. to review on this one okay. why we think it yeah. needs a little more time okay um as similar to the next one is the North Sea Beach Colony. Um, 
wastewater improvement project. Now you're familiar with the North Sea Beach Colony because they Absolutely. just did an erosion control district. This actually, the, the spreadsheet is wrong. It says IA system installations for 62 parcels. It's really only 25. Um, so the whole beach colony consists of 62, but they're only proposing 25 at the moment. This the is the one we, with the Peconic Baykeeper, and we couldn't Bay find Keeper space for a cluster be the system. Man this would be like the first clustered system? No. No, it's not a it's cluster. Not they no want space to do individual, well, they want to do individual IAs, IAs across yeah. these 25 parcels. But get a, parcels. an economy, a, a, oh, a savings see. based on them all purchasing in yeah. a similar time. Sean O'Neill from the Peconic Baykeeper approached us and, and pitched this to yeah. us. Yes. And Although their numbers point. don't really flush out. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we really need to work a little more on this because if you did the math, 25 homes times 20,000 we would give for rebates would equal half a million, not 867,000. So this, they're 367,000 over what we would give on a rebate. According so to what I have here, it's 34,680 if you divide. 867 by 25. Right. It, it certainly so, should. You know, and our rebates are income based. And this doesn't prove that out because it doesn't so, prove that out. So they so, potentially could be getting more rebate than they would be entitled to exactly. under our. And income many of these department. parcels have significant issues in terms of grading and whatever. And so they, they did look up, they did a nice application, and I, I really think that this has a lot of merit. It's just how can we do this and also tap into that county and state money because yeah. it would be such a waste for us to not utilize that money that has no income restriction by the way right. um, well they might have been in calculating their number they might have figured in some of the you know engineering costs they did but there's no economy of scale there and we talked to them about that because yeah. you know they're they're talking about you know we were like well if you have a surveyor doing 25 lots they shouldn't be charging you so you know so yeah. there's more work here that yeah, needs to be done and we really need to I work like with the, the idea county. I mean it would be yeah. a big deal to get 25 IA systems into one neighborhood totally but we oh. just have to be equitable because in some cases you would be giving maybe forty thousand dollars a lot here and that's mm -hmm. not and that's fair. that's it's completely different than what we're experiencing in the real world right now. So th these numbers are definitely out of sync. And they and we we really support that the the committee is really interested, and I know you are too. But it's just getting the numbers down, and leveraging maybe what we would be willing to pay with these other funding pots, because just going through the CPF is not. Uh, this seems also. I mean, this is 62 lots in the entire area, and 25 are on this list. My guess is that some of those 25 are like next to each other. And why couldn't they share one system? Well, that's the other thing. We haven't really looked at like, is there a lot we can purchase right. in this area? Just put well, it as, I know in our meeting is with, funky. In it's our very difficult. meeting with Sean, that systems. was a question that was asked, and they indicated that there wasn't. I, I don't think that that's actually the case. I would rather see the 62 or the 20, even the 25 put on one system because of the, the uh, economy of scale here. That's, well, that's a sort of a different thing than what I'm saying. I, I get that. If you could make it a clustered system, that would be great. But even if you can't, some of these houses that are next to other houses this, it would make sense for those two to share one if we can work out an agreement. That's what I'm saying. We well, need to talk to the we, county. We so need maybe to get instead of building twenty, here. instead of building twenty-three of these, maybe you only have to build fifteen. Well, there's only one expandable right. system, so it has a lot to do with the technologies of the systems themselves. So they are they are geared towards residential, you know, to approximately five homes. One yeah. of the, one of the systems. So what I'm saying is that if you have if saying. you have a two bedroom house and a three bedroom house next to each other, they could share a system, hmm. right? If you had a five bedroom house and a five bedroom house, there's no system that they could share, and that has to, you have to lay that out. So there's a lot of work still here to see what's what's actually going right. on. I really think we need houses. to we need to take a closer look at this and try to get it where it needs to be mm -hmm. to fund it. I don't think it's there. Yet. Yet, and then the income, the, the income we, issue. We love the idea. It's just the justification isn't fully there yet. Right. The cost benefit the analysis is, yeah. is not there. And the income <coughs> issue that needs to be vetted through each of each of the participants to see how much they would contribute under the residential installation. Right. And, and how much they can get from Suffolk County. Right. Well, the Suffolk right. County has basically said they would batch the applications, but it's still up to the individual homeowners to apply. This is kind of a scenario where the Peconic Baykeeper is acting as intermediary and applying for everyone. Uh, 
It's a good idea it from entirely uh, work in our system. It's new, so we just we need, need to, to see the economy of scale because yeah. we're not seeing. And it. it's a good idea from a distance, but it may pro you know it looked good. Maybe these are the issues that are coming out of this that may be a little prohibitive. Yeah, we, we need don't to know that if we're going to go this route, that we have gotten more IA systems in for our dollar than we would have otherwise had we treated this individually. Exactly. That's yes. right now. It looks the opposite. And like yes. Janice said, this is certainly worth looking at. And sure I applaud is, the Baykeeper for, for going exactly. after this because it is challenging. Um, in addition to the, uh, to the IA systems themselves, there's also legal ramifications between different lots and how people own those lots and sharing septic systems. So there's a lot to unravel and unpack here. Yeah, so I think, you know, we'll keep it on the list, but I don't know if it'll make it yet for this funding round, but I think that... Uh, we just need to work with them and the county to, to see how this can and create a real scalable program for this kind of thing. So that's what they intended to do. That was their whole application. But we're but it's still got a lot of like uncertainties involved that we we can't really account for on our end. You know what I mean? Yes. So um, that's that one. The next one is Quag Wildlife Refuge. Unfortunately, we were very happy to see this one come in, but they never gave us. It was very incomplete. They never followed up. They didn't give me a budget. They said they weren't ready, so we're just going to take this off. Um, but they'll come back. We'll, right. we'll get them to come back. Okay. Um, the next one on the list is West Hampton Beach School District, uh, working with uh, New York State Center for Clean Water Technology. And this is, um, they are looking to, this is actually phase four in the West Hampton Beach's overall picture of fixing their Moneybaugh, Quantuck Bay uh, water quality issues. But they want to... Um, design and install a, a nitrogen removing biofilter, which they can come and explain all this to you. It's quite. It's a horizontal PRB. It's, it's a horizontal PRB. It's like a layer cake. You might have heard those terms. And they do this in connection with the existing sanitary system that's already there. They add these wood chips. It becomes like a science project. But this is a this is a pilot because these aren't approved yet. They said right? that the health and that was our first question to them. They said the health department has allowed them to place them in, even though they don't have provision because they was, they're working in connection with a sanitary system, so they're not in in lieu. So of. instead of going to the cesspools, it's going to go to a. It's going to get like piped field. through this. It's thing. a leach it's, field. It's kind of complicated right. for About me 18. to explain it. But the, but, but the last phase of the current system. But I wanted you to know that the full extent of this. First, they are asking for um, $200,000 for the characterization, design, construction, like all that. And then the ultimate thing is that it would, you know, the second year is a $1.3 million construction cost, which they we asked them for a cost-benefit analysis. They told us that it's the equivalent of 60 homes. So this isn't uh, Department of Public Works? 60 or 16. Work? Sorry. No, this is the six zero. This Thank is you. the school district. Yeah, but I mean, the approval on something on this size is still being run for the health department. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So this. Um, I wonder why. We think this is a work session. I think this is a work session. Yeah, there's a lot to this because my first, my other question would be, with the flow that we're taking from Gabreski to West Hampton Beach, you know, I think it's ninety thousand that's available. That, Sixty. Is it? Oh, it's even less. So I, it wouldn't serve to hook this up into no, the yeah, system no. at all. That kind of stuff I think we need to discuss in I some I do, detail. and I think you need to discuss it with Chris Goldler. Yes. You know, more importantly, the scientists so, in the room. So, uh, so, so this one I would... So, I, just, so it's 1.3 million is the construction and then 200,000 is the design. So it's the total ask is 1.5 million? Yes. And you said it was the equivalent of 60 homes, which would be then $25,000 per home which is more than our grant program. Typically, we provide 20000 a home. So we have to look at that, too, in terms of bank Well, buck. but what they have available from the county, it could be 31000 Well, we don't know. We they don't know that. Problem. So they this would have to apply. I mean, there's a well, lot this to isn't ask. A, a, no, this no, isn't 60 homes. This is just for the high school. I thought you said 60. No, the no, equivalent. The equivalent. Right. Right. Well, you're trying to always right-size this based on what you're buck. giving if, out. For right, but is it? it no, no. So it's 60,000 gallons we were talking about. He's, we're, we're, wait, let me just start. I'm totally confused that. here. 60,000 gallons is not what we're talking about right now. That's oh. the downtown uh, village. That's what's available from the Gabreski system. And that's all spoken that's for. It's got to bypass this. Spoken so for. let's put that so aside. So they're asking for this for the schools. 
Right. To treat what is the flow? Do we know for the school that they are? See, they, these are. This is information that I've asked them to. Right. But you're saying it's equivalent to sixty homes. That's what they told us. Oh, didn't like really. Yeah, it doesn't check sound right yet. to me at all. That's what I'm saying. This so that's what session. sort of what I was saying that if they're looking for one point five million dollars to treat the equivalent of sixty homes, we could give. 60 homes IA systems for less money than this. Yeah. Right. So, and um, I, yeah. so I my comment on your process is we, you come a little early and we get into the grass quickly. I just want to throw <laughs> yes, but, but you see my dilemma now <laughs> yes, that I you're do. going through this, right? Because <laughs> there's certain levels of. But I'd rather, I can't I'd rather you and the water quality board go through that. We did. And then come back. We have it, fidelity. but I want to understand, like, I don't want to put people in a public hearing forum that you don't think are ready to be there. Yeah, that's a, and that, that may even be exec session. I don't know at some point what, that we see a report and then we have a work session to talk about it, something ahead of time. Yeah. Well, you know, open meetings law requires you to talk about this. In public. No, no, I mean this so that be we're better educated important. rather than seeing it like this for the first time, mm -hmm. that maybe we have a little bit more of an abstract of some of these when we, before you come and start talking so we don't for a work session okay. yeah that makes sense. you know sure. one and of the I, you know and if that's you know is, i apologize is this, I don't is this the school board or the school district asking school district the school yeah district. well chris you know kind of pitched it to the school district i the school district the superintendent and board gave us a letter of endorsement uh, who's so new york would be the, I love WT. the center for clean water clean technology, water technology. Yes, yeah. so so what would happen is even the Center for Clean Water Technology isn't really doing the work. They would get an engineer to design it all, and they kind of are the middleman reviewing that. Mm -hmm. And the um, school district would be putting it out to bid and right. all that kind of stuff. So they would be doing all the work. In that let, way. Me, let me say two things. One is I, I love targeting school districts because there's like that's where all the kids are all day. Right. We're able to put one system that treats a lot of nitrogen. I think that's a great direction for us Pre to look nitrogen at. Nitrogen reduction. Yeah, in terms of removing nitrogen. I think that's, we get a lot of, we should get a lot of bang for the buck. And I love this layer cake system because it's non proprietary. It's all, you know, should be a low cost system to install. It's showing tremendous nitrogen reduction. But, but the numbers aren't adding up here. So it does, is there something wrong here? And the, tech, and, and, million? and the technology is not that was, adding up. That was either. their best, that's you know, for us a guess. That and that's what I want them to talk to. Frank Russo, they did one for spring school I believe mm -hmm. and so they can talk to you about the cost they base the cost off that yeah um, and the two hundred thousand dollar the characterization and design that should really inform the costs so these are ballpark estimates yeah I mean you know. you're basically creating a discharge area with layers of sand and wood chips and sawdust whatever it's not the materials aren't that expensive it should not be so expensive I don't understand this 1.3 million and that's why I think uh, you can talk to them about that. okay there, there's a lot of ifs in there and also the if the ifs relative to the technology as well the reason it's being piloted is that it needs to go you know that's the whole idea is that you have to see it over time how it's working and there's a bit of a risk for the school uh, if the technology doesn't Actually, well, he does have some fairly good data mm -hmm. that is um, worth seeing, and that I think I that's was a part real of this decision. skeptic until I, he did the presentation. So I think it's worth you having the presentation. So I would recommend work session. Yeah, I've, and I've the been, wood chips uh, should be free because we have lots of wood chips. That <laughs> are well, available. I think they have to. I don't know that. That's. There's a there's a lot more. You're saying to the it southern pine beetles, yes. there's dead trees all over. Everywhere. I like the idea of the school districts because of the seasonal nature, and they have a, a they have a sewer district over there, um, that really gets a lot of flow in the summertime, and schools are in session, off that time. In other words, in the winter time. Right. In other words, so they that could what, work well what on that system. What sewer district are you? Is, I'm sorry, I'm calling it a sewer district. The West Hampton Beach. Oh, okay. Well, speaking of West Hampton Beach Sewer District, that's okay. the next one. Okay. It says stormwater products on the top, but this is wastewater treatment. So this is now here's where we get into these process conversations, right? We now you've got your tracks. I was telling you kind of look at it like a pie chart, but you've got your tracks <coughs> of what you're funding: reduction, remediation, and restoration. And under reduction, these waste, but these now these wastewater treatment projects can be extremely costly. So are, this doesn't necessarily bode well in a competitive forum where people are asking for, you know, 200,000 or 20,000 versus like 4 million. So the question is, this should be vetted separately. This should be considered by the board and maybe reserved the way you did with the infrastructure for East Quag. We just talked about how much we even have. This far exceeds that. Um, we've, we, 
worked out, you know, maybe they can come and talk to you either as a work session or whatever. Is that, by the way, is that the full cost or is that? No, this is a fraction of the cost, but we've adjusted for what we've been doing. We did the calculation. We come up to like 3.3. What have we given them already in the last round? You gave them uh, 1.3 million for the design, the spec specs. And then we gave them the separate project was a drainage project, which was. Right. Uh, and there's there should be some grants available. I thought the part they did get grants. Okay. You know they need to finally figure out like what they're getting from everyone. They've figured yeah. out the grants, whatever. The state put a lot aside a lot, a lot of, of money, money right? for right. this kind of thing. So now they're asking you for four million. So you have to make a decision, and and whether or not we we recommend less than that. It's just a different. It's just a different animal, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong in this like kind of competitive. It's just a major infrastructure project that kind of needs its own uh, consideration. Is and, my and point. that's that's why. And we're doing as we're doing this, we're realizing like some things are minimal and some things are very big. And and that's why I. What's missing here is the recommendation from your water quality board so that it doesn't become political. It doesn't end up being a decision that's made sort of outside the sphere of, you know. We absolutely have our recommendation, okay. we, um, and we will have that. But I just want to understand how these are going to be processed because there's lots of different things happening at once. So in order to get it to you and through a public process, that's all I'm doing, and you'll have your recommendation, and you'll make your decision. Okay. Uh, either to me, way, that would it's be the first step. The I would like act. to see that before, so that I feel fully informed before I start weighing in. And on and you're not weighing in right now. This is no, just like kind of I wanted are. you to know <laughs> what you've got in front of you. I just wanted you to know what okay. we have, yeah. and that's really just. Can I ask on this project? So, let's say we we gave whatever amount of money toward this project, and now people, businesses start to hook in and they may try to you know get uses that they weren't otherwise able to do because now they're on a sewer maybe they'll put in a second story or whatever the village zoning allows uh, wet uses and things like that we've done that calculation and that's why we'll recommend less than this amount. all right so those people will a we're not funding can't fund exi uh, extra we're only funding the baseline growth yeah, the existing, the existing. What's it, what exists so if okay. they said be. oh we're repurposing we're going from a dry to a wet to us that's adding growth okay. so we are only and, staying and on then whatever are they existing. going to be charging connection fees when oh, yeah. people I mean do we get any money back when they do or no that's going off the additional I don't think so this is yeah. they're asking you for a grant, a grant. right um, yeah do we know the total cost I think if they said 15 million, right. although they haven't done their design and specs that you paid for, so we're so typically, on. you know, this okay. is the this county is too sewer premature to even is, really. I know. I mean, I don't so. even know why we're seeing that because well, we you're seeing get it because them. they've applied and because we want to tell you that we think that you need to keep going with this conversation. The advisory committee will advise you, and we need to understand the formula because there would be many I need things. to understand it because the county, it'll be a county sewer district. It really is a county sewer district with a lot more people in it. And typically, when somebody connects to a county sewer district, they are charged a connection fee. Yes, absolutely. Which will go to Suffolk County. Um, which is 60,000 gallons. I just want to make sure that they're adjusting that connection fee. They, they're, they're not charging them for the money that we provided. For the no, baseline. I think what happens is they take off, say it's 15 million, and they get a million from the state, and they get 2 million from here, and 4 million from you. Then they, in the end, that whatever that cost is gets distributed it's as the distributed. fees. distributed. Okay. Yeah, but those numbers, whatever's, whatever's granted, gets taken off the top. Okay. But that's another, you know, that's this is a work session, but I also think it's premature and I also think it's really next round and I if you, help if the you want to do it, this. you should be reserving the funds as a major infrastructure project. Well, yeah, I'd also like younger. to understand the the full use of the of of the system at Kabreski. Mm -hmm. So they're taking a portion of the available flow, mm -hmm. but I don't even understand what the relationship what, if there's a fee charge uh, from the development that's that's dependent on that up at the airport right now. Mm -hmm. And if there are costs associated with that, we should be able to back those costs out from what we're going to pay for. Right. And Plus, most of these costs are really, it's not really a wastewater treatment well, let me, issue. Let me it's finish, really Dennis. Uh, go to opinions to find out if this is even fundable in, in certain respects by CPF. You know, that's important because I don't understand the relationship between who's actually operating that sewage district plant up, up there. I don't know who's operating it. It's so a it's county a, facility, county, right? County so, operates it. Yeah. yeah. But, but they're going to charge who? The users of the district. Right. 
So I don't know, and I think it's a good point that the supervisor is bringing up because that could be a significant amount of money that they may charge for sixty thousand gallons of treated flow. We want to make sure they're not plus the cost of pumping up, it up against for money that we laid out. Right. Yeah. That's and if they are, we should be getting it back then for our water quality. Program. Well, is it a loan or a grant? That's the question. Is well, that's it. it. And so there's a lot of unknowns different. here. Right. So right. But I think that's so, but I think we had to continue the dialogue and and get them to come here and work. Can, can I ask you form? talked about staging a project like this, and I think we have staged other projects, but I, I just want to make sure we can do that. So let's say we encumbered a million dollars a year for the next four years. Let's say it was a four million dollar project. Can we? Is there a mechanism that we can legally do that? Yes. You mean roll you'd have over? to prove the yeah. full project? Yes. And you have to reserve the full project and then, and, then, and then come back. So I'm saying you might want to do this early next year mm -hmm. and whatever the number you feel comfortable with and then just reserve it for this project so that the granting the rest of it, you know, we're not, uh, you know, competing for the same funding. If you've already right. decided but that you, you guys want to give need them whatever to tell it is. us based on. We, and we absolutely are going to tell you. And I right. apologize, you know, I thought that instead of. Because my idea is that you should really hear the proposal before you hear what we recommend, right? Well, you're getting recommendations just, and things. Well, well I mean, just a, trying to a list out would do, you know, uh, to be honest with all you, because we, we all these questions we're going to ask. Another. So we're going to ask here. your your applicant 100%. these questions, and that's what I think you should be doing. Yeah. All right. Let's keep going. Right, keep right. going, and then these are the last ones. So that was the last uh, wastewater treatment. Now we're under aquatic habitat restoration. Um, the first project is a proposal by Peconic Baykeeper with the trustees endorsement and this is for the in Cold Spring Pond right here. Um, they're asking to do a, um, it's called Oyster Nitrogen Bio Extraction and Restoration Project um, where they basically it's an aquaculture project where they would grow 60 to 80,000 oysters, 5,000 retained for an educational program um, and move on from there. So this is a small cost uh, annually for four years. Uh, the startup cost is, is 35, about 35000 What's this plus 20, 19? 20, it was like 55000 four times four. Not that small a project. No, it's about 100 and, uh, let's see, 20, 40, 60, 80. For 60 to 80,000 oysters. 198 per year moving yeah. forward. Well, I, don't I don't understand this. I, well, if, if, if they're growing sixty to 80,000 oysters while you have 5,000 being retained for an educational program, where, where are the other 55? Oh, they're going to the to trustees to put in various other waters to seed, you know, put them around town. Um, Do we have control that they're not just then getting scooped up and, you know, and then sold? sold. Yeah, it, we said the same thing, and they said, you know, part of it is actually remove, you know, we don't have that assurance. We, you know, East Hampton had this very program. They think it's an excellent program. Whether or not you want to do it here, I think you need to have a, a presentation made to you by, by I Peter I just want to make sure if we're buying $60,000 worth of oysters and putting them out there, somebody's not harvesting at some point and, and profiting from that. They, they may be. Um, I mean, we run almost at some point, and that's the bio extraction. Miami You're getting no the cost, nitrogen so out I, as well. I, you don't want them to deteriorate, you know, at some point, right. you do want. Well, to just I think we need we have a fiduciary responsibility. Absolutely. Yeah. If somebody ha knows exactly where the oysters were then placed, they have obviously an inside track. And I track. think you need to talk to them about that. And so this is a work session. You know, if they're work. ending up in a sanctuary where they can't in a no-take sanctuary where they continue to remove, uh, you know, algae or something like that, and it, it might make make a lot so of sense. We're, and we're, is it really a nitrogen removing or an algae re remediation project? Well, we're removing out nitrogen through the algae. Right. The Dennis, algae is yes. Just a, a question about the numbers here. You have 34,000 uh, plus 19. So that would be algae roughly 56,000 in the yeah. first year and then 19. That's what no, the first year is the 34 dollars. only. Oh, okay. And then, and then 19, the 19 for the four well, subsequent well, years. Well, okay. Any technology that gets yeah, done has to last at least five years, and that's why they're proposing that way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I just, you know, for comparison's sake, at Tiana, we're, we're growing comparable to this or more just in a community garden at no cost. So I, you know, we need to look at this in comparison to other programs we have, we, you know. So, right. And so um, 
the committee was has you know we're gonna make recommendations you know in some instances like in CPF committee proper you, they, you don't necessarily they see you know do you want it to be that kind of situation where we're making that judgment call and you don't you know never know it or these people have a chance to come and talk to you about work session we give you a recommendation and then whether or not they pro progress to a public hearing I like many of the other projects I just need to know more detail yes and that's I mean, why it I sounds think like that it potentially is a good it from project the mouth it's an aquaculture speech. project I just yeah no, actually, we I don't. Know the what, details. what I'd like to hear it from is is from the Water Quality Board, which is its, it's mandate is to look through these things and give us, inform our, our decisions so that we um, can ask the questions wait, that we need to ask. Of and course. Not be led. Uh, but the question is, are you wanting any of these in front? Not, you know, uh, there's like this sense of elect to consider, or you just wanted us to say, like, these are, don't make the cut, and these are the ones that do. I think John is on the right track here that perhaps the board is acting in a way that the water quality committee should be. We did all uh, of this and we have our recommendations and we're planning on giving and them that's, to you. So and maybe I want to trust those recommendations. We want to be sure that, you, that everyone gets their due process right. also. There's a lot is, of is, money. Is the question here. Because if Are you know we what circumventing I mean? this water quality committee? Not at all. Really? We, we're, we want to give you recommendations. Uh, we have them. So we think that you should also hear the project proposals. Well, I, you know, here's my here's my problem with with this is that you have like the Quag Wildlife Refuge that's incomplete, can't move forward. Oh, okay. we know that. I, I see that on I, paper. I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have a discussion with an applicant that's not ready. No, for and so uh, okay. So maybe it was a mistake to come here and no, talk no, about I, it. I don't, no, I don't. I don't I think it's right. I, I like hearing this because the numbers on this are so. I, I mean, they're uh, particularly the West Hampton Beach one, which we really do support and want to see in. But that's four million dollars, and the others are twenty. I think this. I think uh, we're being asked for a little guidance here as far as you know where the money is to go, um, since we. Well, you, we have our recommendations, and we just are like certain things I want to put on the agenda for public hearing. Mm -hmm. Certain things I want to put on the agenda for a work session, and certain things I want you to know we've we've received them, but they're not going anywhere yet. So and that's really so the, point. Right. the public hearing that you had, and I, I can't speak for other members of the board. I watched that. I think I watched it twice. Right. It's pretty cool, you know. And it was interesting. And I sat there, whatever. And I and I watched the thing, and I I got informed. And then we got the actual plans, and and I felt very well informed with those. Okay. Um, we just thought we would do it a little differently because the stakes are a little higher and it's a lot more involved. So instead of us doing and it, they are. we and as far wanted as you to be able to have the work session with our recommendation memo vetting out everything we think. But so you have the ability to hear it and, and ask the questions The distribution well. of funds with that information and the scientific ref recommendations from your board, I think, really should guide us. Okay. Is that so can yes. I have you had your work session with these new projects yet? We've talked to all of them. They have not been videoed. It hasn't been videoed. So, I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe you do that. We already know this. all of these. We've asked all these questions. We have a recommendation for all of them. I'm just trying to figure out the track they belong to get out in front. But that's I think really we're saying is comes down. we don't have, I think those recommendations we need to see before we can, or at least for me, to decide, okay, which one should we have a public hearing with and which one should well, we have a work right. session with. And one of the questions I'm hearing is like to what degree should someone who's asking for 19,000 and we think it's a slam dunk actually have to come in and present or Well, I think for the public's the water, sake water it's worth board, having so. them out here. Um, for public so Well, then that one perhaps can go straight to public hearing. If everybody right. thinks, "Oh, that's great and we see it looks really good." I think some of the I think what I'm hearing and I don't know if I need to go any further is that we had a good process by maybe changing it you might be uncomfortable because I'm putting it well, in the front one of good you. thing about this I and mean, if you're telling me these were already vetted by the water quality they all were reviewed I, I think coming here maybe first say these are all the applications that came in we could then say well okay this is something we want the water quality board to consider when they're deliberating right you know like you know the question about the oysters and where do they end up at the end how long are yeah. they in the bay? You know, and are I they think, are they going to be commercially harvested at the end? Who, uh -huh. and where will that money go? Are, do they they reside certified zones, uncertified zones? You know, right, what, what, right. Um, and that's all good. You know, all good are stuff. The shells and going I, to be used for the reefs, reef construction. I mean, there's a lot of things to that. I, so on its face, it sounds like a good project. We want to have these things really thoroughly vetted by that committee and then come to us. 
if right. you want to do a preliminary kind of look-see at the town board level, if it's something that we know we won't consider, so we don't waste their time, well, that's or we don't think it conforms it, to the yeah. program, or it's not a direction we want to go, it's possible, but then we could probably do this much quicker. And right. I understand your, your, you know, when you did the televised stuff, those were fairly straightforward projects. So you're a little concerned, and I, I get that. I think we can wade through that. It would be nice to see that uh, ahead of time. Your recommendations, your list, like like I said before, I, I think you're on the right track. But I I personally really like to sit back as a non-participating observer and see the app the the inter exchange between the applicant and the board, the water quality board. I I think that's really important because that informs our decision okay. in well, the first place, and then the complexities of it as an overall. Right. In other words, town-wide, so, you know, that I think is probably more decision that comes to policy within the, the town board itself. Okay, so, um, I don't know if you want to go any further. Yeah, let's just get yeah. through it. We're almost there. Yeah, we have three to go, keep so let's just um, The Mill Pond Association, we think this one you is the ready. the Mecox Bay sensor. Oh, I'm sorry, Mecox Bay is the trust. Last time you approved the water quality sensors, as part of their aquatic restoration project, they're asking for two additional sensors. Okay, they went and back and tried to design to it all, and they're asking for two additional sensors. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah, that yeah. one I think should go to public hearing. But I also just should be informed that you know PEP, the USGS, uh, is looking for places to put some of their monitoring systems. And Fantastic. Well, well be, we can talk about that. In yeah, lower talk that. Talk to Joyce about that because that just came out. I, I think I forwarded it to you guys, but if I didn't, remind me. Um, that may, there may be no cost here. Is what I'm saying. Oh really? No, well, okay. because they may their system. They may place their systems and help with whatever. I, you know, not knowing the actual details of who maintains what this what equipment and protects this equipment. Somas. So, okay. Because I was going to say, if you're going to put, I'm assuming it's like twenty-five thousand dollars a sensor. It's one is like a, a land-based sensor, and one is another like floating buoy type sensor. What right? is but dynamics? Is is hydrodynamics, sensor. and but it's not chemical sensor. So I just want to make sure that they're not subject to theft, or they're insured, Absolutely. or all those things. Yeah, you know, I agree. They're protected. Um, and okay, um, the next one is called Mill Pond Association, and this proposal is for carp removal and the construction of two. Uh, floating constructed wetlands in Mill Pond. This is the mm. Princeton Hydro recommendation? This is the Princeton Hydro thing. I think they're ready to go to public hearing and um, the committee supports this. We don't have an issue. Yeah, I, I saw a draft of the report. It looks pretty good. They, I think the board should probably see that. Unless you want to have a work session. They're kind of like That's under it. some tight time frames. So at least uh, the public hearing, the I Princeton the Hydro guy can come and Yeah, I, I think you can move forward. A lot it's, of work's gone into this. Yeah. Um, and the last one is Sagaponic Pond. Now, first, this came in. Town trustees were just asking for budget toward um, the inlet management. Uh, we we talked to them at length about how dredging is not really a water quality project in and of itself. It has to be tied to a management, a management plan. plan of some sort. So they've come back with a a management plan. Uh, Produced by Chris Goldberg. It's I didn't even write the cost down. It's extremely expensive. For I hands. don't know. What's H A B S? Uh, harmful harmful items. Oh, okay. I think we just need to talk to them some more on this one. Yeah. Uh, well, they did this for Meekox. Yes, and we're all for that. It's just the cost associated with the newest, latest revision of a proposal is. is so that this would be developing a general management plan for Sagaponic? Yes, and we've encouraged Sagaponic. them to do that. And we were really happy that they responded so positively toward that. So, but but we just need to, you know, get that to a place where everybody can feel comfortable. So this is something that needs to wait, that we need to vet this a little more okay. carefully. Okay. Yeah, particularly the multiple openings and closings of the end. Yeah. Uh, Right. Okay. So, so out of all of these now, we um, we have a few work sessions, a few public hearings, and that's all I really wanted to know. And I also wanted you to know what we're looking at and what we're going to be providing specific mm -hmm. recommendations to. If you liked it the old way, do that again. I thought maybe you would want it more like interactive for you versus me standing at the podium like, yeah, this I is... I think this has been productive in the I sense that there's a lot of issues that came up that you can now take back to the Water Quality mm -hmm. Committee just right. to make sure they've been properly addressed. 
right. before they go to public hearing. It gives the presenters a chance to know what's coming at them. Absolutely, the and we, you, before we interview the people, we send them a letter with all our questions. Then they come in, and some, in many cases, they responded in writing. Um, we'll get this all so that it could be posted online. You know, the ones that are moving at least forward for a work, you know, public hearing, work so, on the ones for work session. So we want people to be able to perfect their applications based on all this so, feedback. So my main concern is the the, and I've talked to both of you that I, I feel you're getting burdened with a lot of administrative overhead on this kind of stuff. So, you know, because my first reaction is I'd love to see this list with a little abstract after, you know, it, as a discussion of context next to an Excel spreadsheet that tells me what the costs are and, you know, what the balance. So the we do balance, have that. I know. just broke it out into two parts. Of yeah. That so I'm, okay. I'm saying, you know, you could be adding more layers here than, than, than no, you, you don't want. need. Right. Okay. I just I'm I concerned apologize. about that. I'm you. glad that you gave me some direction, and um, you know we'll work on basically getting this into a form that you can feel comfortable with, so it's in okay. front of you. Excellent yeah. job, though. But it's cool that that we have this so widespread across the town, right? And so many. The best part entities. is like it, the way we've done it is it's kind of created like an emerging quality where things are or self-organizing and groups are coming right. together, which has a better, you know versus us trying to go out there and solve it all you know yep. and so right. that's, that's I think, the uh, best part I don't think there's going to be an awful lot of money available this year in this round. So we may not be able to do all these things. Exactly. Yeah. And that's that's this column over here, you know, to weigh that against the diminishing total here. So we'll give the uh, committee's recommendations and then as part of that package, do you also want copies of the applications? Uh, Where I was going to post them all online, I'll give you the links like I did last yeah, time. Great. So you don't have to worry Perfect. about paper because mm -hmm. this is only one. <laughs> small pile of them right, yeah. <laughs> and then um, the ones we discussed I will schedule and you'll see them on the work session agenda so, so I just know want what to be, they are I just want to be sure Dennis in terms of lessons learned from the last round that yeah. you're coming here with a suggested procedural change um, that there's the basis of it that we're not overlooking the basis of what you're proposing as is this part of is this reaction part of what you learned last time that you feel a need to, to have more steps as, before it gets in front of the town board? I thought, you know, how you do in zone change applications where you say elect to consider so someone doesn't go too far down the road without you saying, you know, I don't really think this is appropriate at this time or yeah. we're really not focused here at this point. I thought maybe you might want to consider adding that in because there might be a point in time where you really feel strongly about one project but you have ten other ones and you're like, I, you know. Well, see, I don't want to feel strongly about any one project. I want to see a, a metric that's untouched by any personal desire to push a project through because mm -hmm. I think that's the right method to use. It's ultimately our goal here is is the restoration of our, our ecosystems. And, right. And the best it just way to comes get and there. the way this project plan is written, it says you have the town board may prioritize projects so I was trying to get that sense yeah and I, I tend to look I, at the I like this the, idea I think this is a good idea. is this something that you don't want to see or no I'm, I'm like just I'm trying to understand it I just there's a, a lot to do with this represent this is a tip of the iceberg and what this tip this water quality board does to get to this point is a lot a lot of work and I understand and the point that you don't want to just sort of kick something out because you don't understand it. You know, I think it's more important. We to are going it. to say, you know, like this doesn't really, you know, this particular project doesn't have measurable water impacts. You know, where yeah. it does, and, and it's costing you a hundred dollars a pound of nitrogen. Yeah. You know, we we we've got it down to that. That also uh, may be the part that's the the board's purview, and and maybe not the bo your board's purview. Well, I think yeah. some of the policy questions yeah. on what types of projects you're mm -hmm. going to consider. And how they fit into the overall budget, and then also on, um, you know, on a major project, you know, if it is something from a policy perspective you want to consider as part of this program or something else. And I fully expect that policy to to uh, evolve over time. You know, well, as we start to see improvements in certain things, you know, we may, you know, reprioritization occurs. But I think that comes out of the the analysis. I mean, and also, you know, it just is like next round are you going to say we're funding up to x for drainage projects funding up to 
why for wastewater yeah. projects. You I'm, might want to put a cap. We would cast a wide net and not put a cap, but then you end up in these categories that are hard to compete against. One person is asking for 20000 another person is asking for $4 million. So, you know, they're not competitive necessarily. You want to put them in their buckets so they can compete at, a, at the same level. Yeah. And we may I, have more applications. This year you got 12. What if we get 35? Well, right. I'm just looking ahead always into how to make this the streamlined right. process that everybody can understand. Because when people call me and say, well, what's the process? You know, I, I want to be able to have that nailed down. And I don't, you know, it's we had it one way, we're trying to do it a little different so you're more informed, um, you know, giving some direction. But either way, I'm, you know, we're open to however All we right. do it. So All I right. think everybody maybe Thank gives, a, gives us some thought and we'll. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks Lisa. Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. All right. Um, so let's go back to updates. Um, I'll continue with a couple things. I. Um, did have the opportunity to go visit with uh, Moody's Investor Services because we're getting ready to go out to bond to uh, make a pitch for the town's credit to try to get us the lowest interest rates we can get. Um, I was joined uh, by um, Noah from Munistat as well as uh, Len Marchese, our controller. controller. Um, we went into Moody's. Uh, Right near the uh, the Freedom Tower, right there in uh, Lower Manhattan, I thought it went really well. I led the presentation. Um, they had some great questions. They talked about uh, all the great things going on in the town. Some of the things we talk about here, like uh, the investments we're making in infrastructure, um, the uh, uh, the assessment base growing, assessed valuation growing, all, all, all the. Um, good financial metrics that we've been experiencing. Uh, so I think it went really well. We should know very soon, um, maybe even today, um, as they release their report. Um, and trying to maintain the AAA credit rating we were able to achieve just a couple years ago from Moody's. Um, so um, we'll know soon. And uh, I, I think we did a good job answering all their questions and presenting a really great picture of the town's finances. Um, I want to remind everybody, and Julie probably has this on her uh, updates, May 8th, the straw ban, plastic straw ban, goes into effect. Um, I'll, I'll let Julie mention, talk more about that. Um, John and I were able to attend the ribbon cutting for the Phillips Cancer Center, um, right? Did anybody else go to the Jumpy Jumpy there? It was really That's amazing. We got to tour this place. facility. Uh, Southampton Hospital has opened this state-of-the-art uh, cancer treatment facility, uh, largely through a, a tremendous gift from the Phillips Family Trust. And, uh, you know, on behalf of the town, you know, we're so thankful. This is a really an enduring act of love for the community and for all of the people who will be treated and hopefully cured at this facility. So on, I didn't get a chance to speak, but um, you know, on behalf of the town, we thank them from the bottom of our heart and lungs and kidneys mm -hmm. and brains and prostates and breasts and everything else that gets afflicted by cancer. Um, it's really a, uh, a great, great thing for, for the community. And uh, many people did speak. Assemblyman Thiel spoke quite eloquently. And um, several of the... Uh, the doctors and deans at uh, Stony Brook spoke, and of course Bob Challoner led the presentation. And, uh, John and I got to tour it, and the equipment there is just like, top notch. You have to understand, like when you're going through cancer, as unfortunately you know so many people do, and you're going through radiation or, or chemotherapy, you have to go this great distance to be treated, or you used to have to go used a to great to distance, and. You know, you come back exhausted, you know, trying to drive an hour plus, sometimes in traffic. Um, to have a facility like this right here in our community is, is extraordinary. And so, again, just thank you to the Phyllis Family Trust and to uh, Stony Brook Hospital and Southampton Hospital for making this happen. Um, it, it was interesting, too, uh, just as an aside, uh, talking to some of the staff there that are all so excited to be working there but also realizing that a portion of the staff, they have to drive from outside of Southampton to come here. So um, I, I was talking with a couple of the uh, emergency room nurses and some of the uh, oncology nurses and uh, 
it, they're really, really interested in, to help us to find affordable housing to help staff. Mm. And uh, so maybe we have some, we have a commitment to work with, with them as well to help uh, provide housing that we so yeah. desperately need for this service. It's, it, you know, it's, it's just one of many, many. I services. have to say, you know, during that tour, you know, we met some of the nurses and some of the radiologists. And, Everybody was so amazing. Know, was really they were so so skilled, so well trained, and but also so nice. <laughs> you know, so nice to us as they showed us the equipment, and you could see the sense of pride that they had yeah. in this facility. Uh, Except when we were asked to step back from the cyclotron. That was really <laughs> <right>. <laughs> the architect is a uh, Blaze McCoy, and it, it really is really a, a stunning, a stunning building. Um, so and it's set up so that cancer patients. Yep. Right, it was a st stacky yeah. owned property and it was an old kind of dilapidated potato barn on it not that long ago. Yeah, not long ago. And I think they did a really good job. And but that, I, I was impressed with the inside, the way it was laid out. You know, I don't know if any of you have seen, there's a movie about the Mayo Clinic. I, I think it's on Netflix. It's really worth the watch because how, how this kind of stuff evolved. So they've really kind of taken that Mayo, Mark, uh, Mayo Hospital market um, model to to this and so you have these areas where you know somebody's going through intense chemotherapy there's a lot of time it's it's just set up in such a way it's and and it's here locally which is i went through this with my mother uh try, taking her uh into the city and back and back and forth and back and forth and you know I, I would have given anything to have a facility like this out here so i think this is a huge service to this town it's, so, so let me thank you, Stormy, mention another upcoming event. This is a, it's kind of an interesting event. It's a parent roundtable on Tuesday, May 14th, starting at 6 o'clock to 7.30 at the Greek Orthodox Church. And this is on opioids, uh, vaping, and alcohol use. Um, you remember we, we held a number of forums with the Opioid Task Force. We did uh, lots of community forums. We did one for youth. Well, we never did one for parents specifically. And this is really specifically for parents uh, to help answer questions and to help um, them learn the warning signs of, signs of addiction and how to prevent addiction. And you know, it's one of the big focuses of our task force was not just to take the drugs off the street, which our police department is doing an excellent job, and not just to get people who are users into treatment, therapy, but also to stop the next users uh, and, and to catch sort of, you know, the patterns of addiction early. And uh, this is part of that, working with parents, uh, working with the schools. So again, this is going to be, um, May 14th, 6 to 7.30 at the Greek Orthodox Church. It's a really an amazing facility they have on St. Andrews Road. And uh, if you want more information, you can RSVP to uh, C. Conway, C-O-N-W-A-Y, at SouthamptonTownNY.gov. Or, you know, get in touch with my office or CRC, and we can give you additional information. And uh, Last thing I will mention, um, there is a hearing coming up on the proposed incorporation of e East Quag that will take place on May 13th at 6 p.m. at the East Quag School. This is not um, a town board hearing. It's just the supervisor who's charged uh, under the law with reviewing the petitions. This is not a hearing on whether you think incorporation of East Quag is a good idea or a bad idea. It is limited to the sufficiency of the petition that was submitted as whether it meets the requirements for holding a actual vote on incorporating these clogs. So um, I will be taking testimony in that regard on the sufficiency of the pe uh, petition and again it will be May 13th, it's a Monday at 6 p.m. at the East Quag School. And that's all I have left for updates. Uh, anyone else want anything, Julie? Uh, so our, our polystyrene and plastic straw and stirrer ban is going into effect on May 8th, as you said. Um, the reason why I got involved is uh, was threefold. One is plastic has an effect on the health of humans and animals. Two, we have a huge trash problem, as you said. Um, and three, we want to educate people about reducing and reusing and recycling. 
Um, so all that kind of came together with the straw ban. Um, unfortunately, we did have the public hearing last Tuesday on the stir the stirs that will be allowed at the self-service beverage stations. Um, we can't adopt that until the following town board meeting, but I'm hoping that we will. Um, but again, May 8th, um, please recognize what you're using. See if maybe you don't need to use that straw. See if maybe you can use a reusable bottle like this. Um, can and we do anything on the, uh, so this law is going to affect on May no. 8th. Can we not enforce that piece of, about not having the stirs available? I would say yes, we can't enforce that piece. We if cannot some, enforce it, yeah. We, yes, okay. <laughs> right, until well, there's a, there's, until we adopt it. There's it, a grace it's, period built into the law, though, for, for implementation, correct? No. I don't know. No, this is I thought, May 8th. I thought May 8th. that there was an informal sort of grace period to allow people to, to so strict we did, enforcement. We did speak about that, working okay. with, the, with the community and with right. the business owners to allow them we, we did mention that we were going to try to work with them for yeah uh, for a period of time. Okay, so changed I think it's over. A, sort of an but informal I, thing. But I don't think we need to be the plastic straw police <laughs> yeah, on May 9th. Yeah, right. 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 Um, and we did send something out to businesses throughout Southampton Town. Um, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to call my office um, and we'll talk to you. Was, I was out to dinner last night, and this is a place in the village here, not subject to our ban, but. Uh, you know, my son got this big milkshake, and it came with a, pla a paper straw. And I was like, oh, this has got to be a disaster. And it was great. It was fine. Paper yeah. straws you know, aren't what paper straws were it, when it we were kids. They're different. <laughs> it was thick oh, and, gosh. and strong. Yes. And, uh, I, I might he, have a he, sample he back here that I could show you. He thoroughly dad. enjoyed that milk milkshake, and I think felt even better that he was drinking it through a paper <laughs> straw. So. so it is possible. Oh, it tastes better. It wasn't to, a styrofoam cup, though. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> so it is possible no, to change your habits, which is behavior change is a big thing in, in It was this great that the movement. restaurant was voluntarily. Oh. This is a restaurant that... A lot of restaurants have voluntarily already started to change. I, a lot of our businesses, I think, no. really see the value in this. So it's, it's good to see. I just, oh, Julie, I, you know, I just think you deserve great applause for oh, moving this you. forward. It, it was, uh, I thought there'd be a lot more controversial. Uh, it turned out to have broad base of support, but uh, well, again, I think people are realizing we need to do something, and even though it may be a small step, it's still. No, but thank could you for your leadership on this. Thank you. Mylar balloons. That's what I'm speculating. That's, that's next. what's coming next. All mm -hmm. right. Soon. Any any more updates? Yeah, just one more on the South Fork Community Connection. Um, I drive by the Hampton Bay Train Station every morning, and the spots along Good Ground Road are slowly but surely getting taken up. So okay. every day, it's a few more cars parked there. So people are using. And we did have a good meeting with Assemblyman Thiel, like trying to look at what issues we're having and, um, you know, is trying to fix things for next year. We had on the phone uh, Long Island Railroad and, you know, there's not a, a lot of changes or tweaking that can happen this year. You know, we know that there's an issue with that first train coming from Spionk, but the second one only going to Hampton Bays, and to get to Hampton Bays, you have to endure the traffic just to get, in, get there. So I think it's something we can fix for next year, probably not for this year, you know, but, uh, but it's, it's a positive thing. We encourage more and more people to take advantage of it. Absolutely. Anything else? That's it. Tommy John? No, just the, uh, the cultural committee trip. We're going to be redoing the bollards at, at the Hampton okay. Bay's train station. I think that's a, a nice, will be a nice upgrade for the community. And uh, public uh, transportation takes time. People need to see it working. Uh, John, anything else? Yep, I'm good. All right, so we have a number of items for executive session. Uh, where is my list? Who has the agenda? All right, so we're, I have it here. All right, so we have acquisitions to discuss. We have uh, a property acquisition potentially to discuss, a building acquisition, a uh, contracts um, to discuss personnel and uh, confidential legal advice. So, uh, I'll make a motion to end our work session and go into executive session. 
on Second. those items. Seconded by Councilman Bouvier. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. I don't know who changed my gavel. It's like four here. I know. <laughs>